Testing, testing, can you hear me? Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Just testing to make sure volume going good. Uh, yeah, volume, everything all right in your hand? Yes, sir, you look clear. Volume, everything, you look like we smooth sailing. Okay, okay. My bad about the time, man. I got uh, I got kind of confused, which uh, you was you know Central Time, and so I tried to get you a little earlier or whatever. But I apologize. My bad. It's all right. I'm just glad that uh, you shown up so many <laughs> folks. <laughs> <laughs> they don't show up or they're late or something like that, you know. So I'm I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's how it is yeah, in the old uh, old black conscious uh, business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, you know, I've been listening to some of your videos. I came across your channel for a while. Uh, I mean, a while ago. You know, I like a I like a lot of the stuff you've been saying. You know, I pretty much agree with a lot of the stuff you've been saying. And you know, it's not about how many followers you got, because you know, like you said, the people with the most followers usually those are the people with the most slaves. You know what I mean? Those yes, are the sir. people with the most the most sheep. You know, it just. Anybody, anybody that's getting paid to say something over and over again, they can't say something outside of whatever their agenda is. So, you know, so I agree with a lot of what you're saying. You know, uh, I feel like you speak a lot of truth, definitely. Thank you. So, uh, so yeah, so I just, I just want to get you on here. Uh, like I said, you know, just go over a few questions, just go over a few things. There's nothing other than what, you know, basically stuff that you talk outside of. Your other uh, videos, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. All right, so you um, so you out of uh, Mississippi? No, um, live in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay, okay. But I was, I was. Okay, yeah. I was born in uh, the state of Mississippi. Okay, okay. That's where um, my family from Detroit, but all four of my grandparents was uh born in Mississippi. You know, they come from out of the you know, when everybody started moving down south to up north in the 50s and 60s, but yeah, all my grandparents from Mississippi. Yeah, um, I was born in Slater, Mississippi in 1963, and uh, I really didn't spend a lot of, of, of uh, my childhood there. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe we left <clears throat> around 1970, 1971, but majority... Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of my uh, people from like the Jackson, Mississippi area, Greenwood, uh, yeah. around Memphis, Tennessee area on the Mississippi side. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then we moved to uh, Illinois and the St. Louis area, like around the early 70s. Okay. So what about you? Um by Hines County, Mississippi, that's where my, some of my grandparents were from. Was from is that in Ronald Jackson? You know, I don't know. I don't remember the counties no more, but I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's go ahead and get to, um, could you explain to me, explain to everybody, um, what exactly is Operation um, Mississippi Exodus? Well, it's, it's very, it's very simple. I'm trying to make it as simple as I as I can. What we want to do is we want to take control of a state. Um, mm -hmm. Not take over a state. This is not we're not a, we're not trying to be some type of terrorist organization. We want to take over America right, and all right. that all, all nonsense. Yeah. We want to take mm -hmm. control of a state in the manner that the Republicans or the Democrats, you know, politically, we want to take control of a state. Right. That's what we want to do. Right. Uh, if you go back and look at the works of somebody like Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer mm -hmm. created a political party. I think I forgot exactly what the name was, but it was like something the Southern Democratic Party, something to that effect. And that mm -hmm. was that was her intent was to create a political party that could bring political influence to that state, and uh, also. When you look at the history of our people, straight out of slavery, our ancestors born in America, I don't know about Africans, I don't talk about Africans, I don't talk about other people, foreigners, I'm talking about my ancestors right here in the United States, the ones that I, I know.
I don't know about those those other persons because they wasn't here to help us. I don't know about people outside of America. But our ancestors right. from slavery, they came off the slave plantations, and even before the slave plantations, they were making moves into the mainstream of this nation, and they understood the power of the vote. This is the reason why the Ku Klux Klan, this is why these those racist organizations was formed in the South after the federal government decided, you know, going back and forth with the South, they removed the troops out of the South. That was our ancestors' protection. And they and then these people began to terrorize our ancestors. But in the meantime, they focus on keeping our ancestors to vote. Now, if you listen to the black conscious community or whatever, you will listen to them and they will talk about and badmouth the, 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 the voting process and things of this nature. I didn't do nothing and blah, blah, blah. Oh, but that's the reason why we're doing as well as we are, we're doing. Because politics is the law. Control of the law. That's the reason why you had slavery to begin with. They made it the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Everything in this nation is controlled by laws. This is a nation of laws. So you have to be involved in the politics. The races of the South understood if black men and women, soul brothers and sisters, if they were allowed to participate equally in the voting process, that would bring them into some kind of power. It would give them some kind of benefit. And they wanted them to stay, of course, in a slave-like position. So they even went to murder in order to stop our ancestors from voting. If voting meant, didn't mean anything, why would you go all out of your way to go stop these people from voting? It's because they understood the power of the vote. Maybe you don't. But they understand the power of the vote. You don't know how to use it properly. You don't know how to use this, this right or this privilege of voting. So what it is with the, to make the Mississippi campaign or try to make it uh, brief and short as possible, we want to be able to take our voting power and not necessarily even create a new party. If that's necessary, that's what we must do. But we want to be able to, mm -hmm. to take that vote and use it strategically. Like the way we vote now, we just vote nonchalantly. And if the politicians mm -hmm. ask us, what do you want? We really don't even know what we want. You know, right. and we, just, we just vote because I, I can do that. But there's no strategy behind it. And as a people... You're not going to get any benefit because you're not voting as a people. You're voting as a bunch of individuals and groups. You must come together as a people and say, this is what we're going to do. And this is where all our vote is going. Now, of course, you don't expect everybody to vote with you, but that's not the key. The key, what, the key to voting is majority rule. That's the key to voting. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to make this a national movement, Operation X, X is Mississippi is a training ground where you can pick one state. And the reason why we pick the state of Mississippi, because it's a poverty stricken state. Nobody really cares about it. If you was talking about New York, uh, it'll be all hell be raised. Hey, trying to take control of New York and trying to take control of California. But see, nobody cares really about Mississippi. It's a poverty stricken state. Nobody really cares about it. So this is where. Those who claim that they have all this knowledge and, and talent or whatever. Now, here you go. Let's take our wealth. Let's take our knowledge, our talent, our wisdom. And let's take this state. Because, see, this is something we've never done before. We've tried, like I was telling you with Fannie Lou Hamer. We've tried in some cases. That's a small, mm -hmm. on a small level, really. This is big. If we can't do nothing big, we might as well not do anything at all. This is something big. Mm -hmm. The benefits will pay off. This is what a gambler would tell you. Most gamblers, either they broke 
or they don't want big because you have to gamble big. Gamblers don't bid, bid small. They don't gamble small. It's 30,000, 40,000, 5,000, 10,000. They don't mess with that chump change stuff. You can't go to the casino and, can I, and you put $5 on the table. They look at you like you're crazy. No, we have to we have to go for the big stuff because we are behind everybody. We have what they call the Venezuelans and these immigrants that's coming across the borders right now. They are becoming our new competition. We are already behind in the game. We already know that there are forces that's against us and really the main force that's against us is ourselves in 2023. You know, a few years ago, you can say, oh, the white man did this and that. No, no, the, the force right now that's stopping us from doing what we need to do now is us because there are a group of, of people who don't want to try new things. They want to continue to do things from the 1960s, 1930s. This is 2023. It's a whole new, a whole new ball game. They want to do things based upon their religion and their political, you know, their, their own political idea, even though this is a political movement, it's not based Republican or Democrat. It's not those type of, you can't think that way. Mm -hmm. Mississippi would be like a training ground for us. We pull mm -hmm. our votes together and what we want to do slowly, little, slowly but surely, we want to vote out the people that's not in our best interest. Now, I, I take it to, see, I, I, I'm looking at Operation Mississippi as a national movement because if necessary, because majority rule, if necessary, we will move people to Mississippi so they can vote. I'm looking at Miss, the Mississippi campaign as a war strategy that you have to understand. And this is, woo, brother, man. This is what I heard Stokely Carmichael say. May he rest in peace. And if you, if you uh, research the history of Fannie Lou Hamer, those brothers and sisters in Mississippi, and he was talking about his, his experience in SNCC. They slept on dirty floors. They slept on the grass. They did whatever was necessary in order to achieve a goal. And this is what this is the way that you have to look at the Mississippi campaign. We are soldiers, and the state of Mississippi is a territory that we want to take control of. And if we have to support others to come to that state and move them, and when you come to that state, even if you have to sleep in a tent, you have to be a soldier because this is what we're doing. We're soldiers and this is the territory that we want to take over. People want to, or they come to me like, um, they want to do, do things comfortable. What is it that they say? Freedom is not free. So in this particular case, if we have the numbers, if we think we have the numbers, then we can do what we want to do. But if we don't have the numbers, then I ask brothers and sisters from New Jersey and Detroit and California and all over the country, support the effort, support your brothers and sisters, just like this, just like we pay taxes for the United States government, for the military, we should pay for our military. But our military, the weapon is a is, is the ballot. Malcolm X, I'm pretty sure you heard of the uh, the story or the slogan from uh, Malcolm X. He said, "The ballot or the bullet." Now we're not in a position. Mm -hmm. We're not in a position to be throwing no bullets. You know, we're not Hamas. <laughs> Nowhere close. We can't even begin to throw no bullets, and our people not interested in throwing no bullet. But a lot of them don't mind going to the ballot. And this is not 1963. Now, Fannie Lou Hamer and a lot of our ancestors, a lot of them were shot, they was beaten, they was murdered going to the ballot box. Now, if you don't believe me, or blowing stuff up and trying to do something to keep us from rallying our vote, 
Because they understand. They understand these folks tr trying to take control of Mississippi. Yes. Yes. Don't you know even the thought would disturb a lot of people. This has never been done. And see, you, and you're not excluding anybody. Because even the people that's non-black, that's non-soul brothers and sisters in the, in, the, in the nation, they will understand with our agenda, even though we're doing it to benefit ourselves, and not really to benefit ourselves, but to give us the, the status and the rights that we should have had under the law anyway. But since the government says we're not going to get it, or they're going to give it to us all la dee da we have to take this in, into our own hands. So we're going to get our own. So, okay. so we go to Mississippi, and we're going to remove the politicians that aren't for us. Some of them may already be for us. But those who aren't, we vote them, simply vote them out. There's nothing against the law to do that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing against the law. Everything you're doing is legal. You're doing what anybody else would do. You want to vote the person that you don't like out and vote the people that benefit you in. That's what you do all over the country. That's what voting is all about. Next year, they're going to vote for a president. They're going to vote the one that they want in, the one they want out, they're going to kick them out. We're doing the same thing. And actually, brother, doing that really is the easy part. The hard part is once you establish yourself, put yourself in this position, okay, so now we control the laws, we control the different things in Mississippi, okay, we run everything. The hard part begins because we've never done this before. It's easy. That's the easy part to get your put yourself in a position, but it's more difficult. How are you going to maintain? Because we're always going to have people. I want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. I want to do it, and people on the side sitting back in the cut, waiting for y'all to mess up. So we have to have things in place and have to be understood. And then of course you're always going to have troublemakers. You're going to have people that come among you. That's their job. They want you to fail. But the hard part or the difficult part is maintaining. The difficult part is what can you do? What are the, this, is, this is what people don't understand. You can't do this and you don't have any creativity. You cannot do this and you have no vision. You cannot do this if, you, if the people don't feel like a people. We have to feel like a people. So when you see everybody, anybody in Mississippi, that's your brother, that's your sister. Or if they're not a soul brother, they're not a black American or a foundational black American or a freedman, then you have to see those people as an ally. And they understand that they waste a lot of money. So the first thing on our agenda is we're going to strip and find out where is the money being wasted. We're going to stop that. We're going to stop our people from filling up these jails and these prisons, wasting money on jails and prisons. You will always have people, because people, unfortunately, some folks are idiots. They do dumb things, so you're going to have to have a jail prison system. But those who aren't on, on a certain level, they shouldn't be in jail prison. We're going to concentrate on the rehabilitation of our people. And this is what some folks don't understand. They think that Angel Snuffin' Up 7, they think the Reality's Temple is against everybody. I know that the Nation of Islam has a good track record and other people have a good track record of rehabilitation of people. Why can't you do that? We know that some of these organizations have a good reputation of establishing schools. Now, you're not going to bring your religion. You're going to have to keep that at home. This is not a religious organization. We don't care what you do in your bedroom, who you're sleeping with. This is a political movement for what is in the best interest of all the people. This is America. But you want to try to get your piece of the pie. That's all that is, it's about. Mm -hmm. That's all it's about. Getting yours. 
I ask the whole nation of brothers and sisters to be involved in this state no different than and this is my favorite example I like using Nelly Nelly is an artist from St. Louis you probably heard of Nelly mm -hmm. and the St. Lunatics yeah yeah when they signed or when they when the record labels were interested in Nelly well actually the St. Lunatics it wasn't no Nelly for some reason they were attracted to Nelly they wasn't interested in the St. Lunatics as a whole so Nelly he's loyal to his group I, I don't I don't they, they want you the group the group said look Nelly get the record deal man I'm part of the group we, we brothers in the, no Nelly go get that record deal and you can bring us after you make it Nelly didn't want to do it but Nelly took the deal his first record went platinum and he brought in all the other lunatics all of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what I'm saying to the nation this is the way you have to look at Mississippi and you have to have confidence in yourself and what you can do I hear y'all talking all this big stuff let's build a nation and, and I, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the God and I'm a warrior here's your opportunity take this poverty stricken state Take your wisdom and build it. Take a poverty stricken state and make it wealthy, make it strong. It's the heart of your nation. We may not live to see the nation, but this is the training wheel that we need in order to get started. We ain't never been, we never governed nothing. And on top of that, this is already functioning. It's not like you gotta start from scratch. You really don't have to change nothing, really. It's already functioning. What we want to do is co take control of it so it can be better and for our best interest. So if we can do that for Mississippi, it becomes our mecca. It becomes our headquarters. It becomes our heart. And it begins to pump the blood to the rest of the brother. And see, you keep talking about Africa, but Africa don't do nothing for us. So we have to create our own motherland. Mississippi is your motherland. And you can pump and help anybody, your citizens, wherever they are in this country. And once you get stronger and stronger, now you can concentrate. Maybe we can do the same thing in Alabama. Then you have Alabama and Mississippi. And maybe you can keep, keep, keep going out and get Georgia. In Tennessee, it gets bigger and bigger. Next thing you know, we got the South. It's legal. There's nothing that you can do about it. Well, actually, they could. They're going to try, of course, when they see that you're doing something like that. But you don't see the benefits. And then we talk about Africa. Each one of these states can be self-sufficient. They, they are designed to be self-sufficient. The governor of Alabama can go to China can go wherever around the earth to make deals and bring that business back to his state. So why can't we, since we love Africa, or if, if, if Africa is the motherland, now you're in a position to talk to Africa. Because right now, we don't have a pot to piss in. The only thing we can do is be a tourist in Africa. No, as a state, as a state, you don't have to be a tourist. Now you're in a position well, Africa, what can you do? What can you do for Mississippi? And this is what Mississippi can do for Africa. Now you can start an import where the United States was going back and forth with China. We can do the same thing with parts of Africa. And it open, the door is constantly open. It's bigger than anything that we've ever done in our generation. And none of our ancestors will get angry. This is what they want for us. They want the best for us. They are the blueprint. They are the blueprint. Folks, folks get on my case because it came from me. Our ancestors were doing, doing, this, doing this before I was born. The only thing I've done was bring the behavior and the activity up to modern times because they couldn't do it 
because of the terrorism that this country put on them during their time. But we don't have we don't have to worry about that right now. But you have to understand that this is a this is a different see look, this is a different ball game. Because Mississippi is still the United States of America. This is not Afghanistan. Mississippi is not Afghanistan. It's not Iraq. It's not North Korea. This is the United States of America. There are people that will say, oh, the government going to do this. Well, if the government can do it to Mississippi, then the other states will say, well, hell, if they can do that to Mississippi, they'll do it to us too. So they limit it and how, and they have to be careful how they treat Mississippi because again, nothing that you're doing is illegal. You're just exercising and finally learn how to exercise your right to vote to benefit you. That's all you've done. And it's never been done before. Another example I always give as a citizen, I don't know if you're if anybody ever heard of dual citizenship statewide. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if anybody heard that. Why can't the state of Mississippi give a loan to a brother and sister in California, one of our citizens. How come you can't do that? Or if our citizen is in California and get in trouble, and we're not protecting murderers, we're not protecting rapists, but should they be able to come to Mississippi, we don't have to extradite like that. We can say, we can say to California, what you want them for? And you're gonna have to explain and really give, show some evidence why you need him back because he said he's guilty and you're just trying to put a charge on you know something they'll let it go because they don't want to go through all that we have nowhere to run these immigrants can come here they can always go back to Venezuela Guatemala they can go back to Africa they can go back to China the black American where can we go where can we run to because I know I watch a lot of crime shows and these immigrants these illegal aliens or however you want to call them, when they get in trouble, they going across the board, they going back home, try to get away from the law. Where do we go? <laughs> where, where can we run to? We don't have a country to run to. So this is why it's important that we make our own motherland, our own country, and then we devise our own rules. And this is not, this is not nothing anti-government because everything that you're doing it's legal. You're going to get rid of all the laws in the state of Mississippi, all the things that's in the state of Mississippi that's bad for us. You're in a position to get rid of all of it. But you're not going to oppress nobody else. That's not what you're doing. You just want to go take control of this territory. So finally, after 400 years, you've, you've created your own safe haven sanctuary state just like these immigrants coming over and what's his name that mayor in uh in new york he's sick of it but they made themselves like sanctuary eric yeah what's his name eric what eric adams yeah I okay so. yeah but new york is supposed to be a sanctuary city right okay well when mm -hmm. when the governor the people of texas start sending these people to you you want to you want to save them or whatever. Now you want to start getting upset because there's too many of them. But the state of those people have been dealing with that for, for, for years and years and years. Hell, well, since it's so great, here, here you have them. Now they want every Chicago is having a problem right now. All these people, they don't know what to, what to do with them. They want to save everybody. And you can't even save your own people in this country. We have brothers and sisters. We have American citizens, including veterans, that's homeless on the street. And you grabbing these people that come from thousand miles away or whatever, hundreds of miles away, and you got plenty of resources for them, and you do nothing for your own citizen. That should not be acceptable. That should not be acceptable. You take care of home first. When my when when now if some people don't want the help, that's different. But you help your own first before helping other people. We have people barely making it. Making a minimum wage. They own these uh, social security disability. Barely making it. We need to take care of our own first. Then we can talk about them. Then we can talk mm -hmm. about them. But I would tell you. 
I've heard nobody bring up a activity like the Operation Exodus Mississippi campaign that can bring the benefits that I'm talking about. Because if you take control, of, look, look what you get when you take control of a state. You take control of the state, that means you control the Mississippi State Police. That means you control the Mississippi National Guard. You ain't never had weapons like that. I mean, in your control like that. Mississippi National Guard actually have tanks. We don't have no tanks, but now you got some tanks. The Mississippi National Guard probably have bazookas and drones and a whole lot of other stuff. We ain't never have, you can't get a hold of no stuff like that. Legally. And you control it legally. You control the laws. When, when a stupid judge is trying to do something silly to brothers and sisters, now you're in a position, uh, we, we don't do that no more. Now you're in a position to do something. Mm -hmm. And we got, like I told you, we have to do something big. But see, in order to do something big means unity. And these people are interested. They have their own agendas. See, you can still be a Muslim. How come we can't take control of Mississippi? You can still be a Muslim. You can still be a Hebrew Israelite. You can be whatever you want to be. This is just a political, it's just a political movement that benefits the people. You don't have to believe in nothing except yourself that you want what is better, not only for us living today, but you're creating a better environment and a situation for your children. I don't have biological children. I shouldn't even care. But I do have relatives. And as an adult, an adult is responsible for children, whether they biologically or not biologically yours. So I want to help the children like Dr. King helped me. Dr. King helped my life be better. Malcolm, Sojourner Truth, all our ancestors are proud of me. They, they helped me live better. I understand that. So now mm -hmm. I'm sitting in their position. It's our turn to make, to make a path so our babies, your children can do better and they can do better for them. It just gets better and better because now we know exactly what we need to do. And now we have the right mindset. It's nothing but up because we're already on the bottom. If you're already on the bottom, there's only one way you can go and that's up. There's only one way for us and that's up. That's mm -hmm. up. And that's what the Mississippi campaign is about. It's not about no religion. It's not about your beliefs or who you sleep with or and all these different things. It's just like the civil rights uh, bill of 1964-65, whatever it was. It has nothing to do with your beliefs. This was a bill that was supposed to be signed for black people. It didn't say, well, uh, only the Muslims, only the Hebrews. It didn't say all that for black people in this country. <laughs> Dr. King stood up fighting the Black Panthers. They stood up fighting for black people. And all these organizations supposed to fight for black people. All that other stuff, that's your own personal business. If you don't like what somebody do and blah, 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 that's your own personal stuff. It has nothing to do because when it's all said and done, when these people go around lynching folks, they don't ask them, are you a Muslim? Are you a Democrat? Are you? They don't care about stuff like that. They only see that you have a black face. And if you're African, well, you look like them. I, I was hoping you was a black American. <laughs> I'm an African. I, did, I just got here. Well, I guess I have to lynch you. I don't have nothing else to lynch you. <laughs> but you look, but that's, we have to put ourselves in a better position than what we've been doing. Yeah. You cannot argue with me because we've been trying to do things a certain way for the last 50 years. This generation has done nothing to benefit us since the death of Dr. King in 1968. They have done nothing. This generation has done nothing at all. You, they've changed no laws. They made, they've done nothing to be. We're living on the scraps of the civil rights. You, we should be embarrassed because we're more educated. We have more money. We have least, because of them, we have least obstacles. But we aren't, we're just satisfied 
with the scraps left over from the civil rights movement. You, we should be happy. I know I am. I, I'm embarrassed. But then you want to turn around, I'm a god. I'm a warrior. I'm a, I, I do it. You, you what? <laughs> well, if you're a god and a warrior, what have you produced except some DVDs and some tapes and some documentaries and you know stuff like that? That's the only thing. That's the only thing they produce. I got a YouTube channel. How does that help anybody? Except some of these YouTubers, they're making good money, you know, on doing it. But that don't help us as a people. The first, the foundation that we need to do is we have to become a people because we're called a people by default. We're not a people. That's the problem. And we talk to each other very disrespectful, very nasty. You'll never become a people like that. We don't have no respect for, for others because we want them to be like us. No, we have to understand See, everybody's reality is different. That's why I don't get angry and upset with nobody. Because we all have different paths that we walked. Yeah, that one, he's a coon, he's a sambo. You don't know nothing about that person. That's their, they, they are walking in the path of their reality. See, I understand where all, all this comes from because I used to be that way. I used to call people coon, sambo. I, I did that myself. But then I began to realize because a brother who I really don't care too much for, but see, wisdom can come from any place. I heard the brother say, y'all talking all this blackly black stuff, but y'all use coon and sambo. Y'all sound just racist as the pecklewood. And you know, I heard him say that and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Those are their words. That's not our words. That came from the slave owners. It's that came from the slave master, Coon, Sambo. And that was for all the slaves. Pick a ninny. That was for all of them. It wasn't, okay, just for you and that. It was for all of you. These people call people Coons and Negro Peans and all like, like they different. You ain't different. We all the same. All the same. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody different. A Negro mm -hmm. Pean. When was you born in Africa? When was you born in a foreign land? You wasn't. You right here with me. You was born here generation. Right here with me. How are you going to make some fun of somebody? And how are you going to talk about how great you are? And some of our brothers and sisters, they learn how they, they are millionaires in this country. Everything is for they can serve. I'm, I'm doing all right. I don't know about you. You know. I'm doing fine. What are you going to do to tell them and make them believe that what you're talking about is better when they millionaires, they got it going on. They don't need your help. And they got all this no black power. All this stuff that they talk about. They didn't listen to John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben. They millionaires and billionaires and didn't get no teachers of the honorable Elijah Muhammad or Noble Joe Ali or Marcus Garvey, they got all their wealth and got it themselves and then some of them don't even believe in God. So you're going to come to them and try to tell them what you have is better. They look at you like, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, <laughs> what, you, what, you, what you got is better. I got 10 swimming pools, bro. <laughs> I got 10 swimming pools. You want one? <laughs> I got 50 cars. You want one? I can go see President Biden anytime I feel like it. Can you? So it's, mm -hmm. our attitude and how we look at things is not realistic. Mm -hmm. We have to meet people. It's like a marriage. Just because a man and a woman love each other in a marriage, they don't get along all the time. They have their differences of opinion or whatever. And sometimes it can get pretty bad. But love makes them tolerate. Love brings mercy to the relationship so that they can stay together. Love makes them be able to work through mistakes and errors. 
See, for us, we don't love. I hear you. I love black people. Uh, whatever. Well, why don't you call them a coon and a sambo then? If you love, if you love black people like that, why you call them a Negro pen? Because they don't believe what you're talking about or, or whatever. Why are you calling people names? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to. If you love, then you you you. When you love, you compromise with your wife. So you can have peace in the house. So you can have peace in the house and peace for the family. You you got the baby to compromise. Mm -hmm. Because everybody is not going to like everything. People that love each other is going to have conflict sometimes. Because we're, we're mm -hmm. all different. But love makes us be able to have understanding. Love makes us have mercy. If I'm a Negro pen, I'm not going to call you no Negro pen. I'm just going to say, well, that brother, you know, he's he's not thinking on my level. I'm going to have to try to find a different way to try to communicate with him. Matter of fact, why don't you shut up? Let a brother who's better at it. Because another thing is a lot of us, we're too emotional trying to talk to people. Mm -hmm. Let the people... Who can do that, do that. You need to shut up and stay out the way. Because, look, during my time in black conscious, I seen a lot of good brothers and sisters leave and just went back to the streets or what or whatever. Because of how they was treated. Because we have Negroes, what well, we used to be called Negro. We have people, persons I, that that that, that they have they have this sickness because they've never been a leader. They've never been in control of nothing. And so they mistreat brothers and sisters when they come into the uh into the forum. Mm -hmm. And people get tired of being mistreated. They say, look, our white man already kicking our ass. I'm not gonna come here and let some Negroes do it. I'm, I'm out of here. They don't talk about that part. We have brothers and sisters, and this is part of the Mississippi campaign too. We have brothers and sisters who are in jail, in prison, and we don't talk about them. We're not trying to get them out. All these black power, all these millions and thousands of dollars, we have brothers and sisters that's in prison and jail right now. They don't talk about them at all. They just in, they just in prison and jail. Suffering. See, that's the part of the Mississippi campaign. The Mississippi campaign is not going to let a sister like Asada Shakur, who is uh, in exile in Cuba, I don't want her to die in Cuba. That's not her home. She belongs here. She fought here. When she takes her last breath, breath, she should be here with us. So as a state, regardless whether they like it, like her or not, as a state, you can go to the federal government and say, look, and make a deal. We're going to bring her home. What do you want? We'll take care of her. You want to lock her up? We'll lock her up right here. She'll be, she'll be in exile right here in Mississippi. She won't be allowed to go nowhere. We're going to bring her home. If you want, if you want her just to stay within, in a, a certain city, she'll do that. But we're bringing her home. We're bringing our people home. We're getting our freedom fighters out of these prisons before they take their last breath. This generation needs to show their appreciation. When they take their last breath, they're going to know that this generation appreciated their sacrifice. And we put up a monument and put their names on that monument forever. That's part of the Mississippi campaign. Okay, so, um, okay. So, um, as opposed to that, what would you say in the, in, for the people, for like, let's say like the Pan-Africanists who are opposed to that, who believe in just giving up here and going back to Africa? Is going back to Africa a scam, or what would you say to those people who just want to pack up and move to Africa instead of focusing on here? I would say more power to you. But that's not the majority of the people in this country we're, we as a people are not going to do that. Even if we 
feel as though we have a connection to Africa, our ancestors, we're not interested in that. Most, most of our people will go visit, they would be a tourist, and come right back home. That's what they're going to do. If that's what you want to do, then you go. Because see, Africa is a relative term. Africa is over 50 different states. Who, they, who are you talking about? Who you want to be with? So these brothers and sisters talk about Africa. They all scattered. A little go over here. A little go over there. And, and, and the only thing that has happened is you're still under the law. You're still under the jurisdiction of another people. You're in a foreign land. I want us to be in a position where we finally can control the law. We finally can say, this is what it is. I don't know what you do over there, but when you come here, this is how we run it here. When you go to those African countries, then you under their law. So you, you might have not have to do, deal with racism the way we do in America, but you know, you still under that. I don't want that. Because our people died and bled here for over 400 years. In every war, including the Revolutionary War. We've, we've invested in this nation. We are just as American, we're just as deserving of walking on this land as the, so, as the Caucasian American. Probably, probably more. Because we gave this nation free labor for 400 years. Hundreds of years of underpaid labor for a hundred years. So why are you going to want to just throw that away to go to South Africa? For what? What's the benefit? Because they're not going to give you nothing. The only thing they're going to do is take. What, did, what is it? They had that uh, that go back to, to the motherland Ghanaian thing back in 2019 or yeah. something like that? Yeah, they had the um, yeah, the welcome back to uh, or something about come back to Ghana, right? Yeah, that right. Turned out to be a scam. Yeah, they got like, like Ghana got like billions of dollars from exactly. Yeah. They estimate two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. How much of that benefit the black community? Didn't to my knowledge, it didn't benefit us at all. No. What did they do for us? Till this day, what have they? What do Ghana do for us? They don't do nothing That's for us. What what we could have done if we had that two billion dollars? But see, the thing about that is, it's easy to say, but we have people that will steal from us. We have people that will do other. They won't do right by us, even if we did get the two. If we invested the two billion dollars in us, they're not going to do right by us. We have enough economics in this country then we could easily fix the water situation in Jackson, Mississippi because I think what they I think it, it cost a little bit over a million some dollars or whatever uh, Jackson, Mississippi been having these water problems or whatever mm -hmm. we as a people economically we could easily solve that give our people clean water in Jackson, Mississippi that ain't that's that's not that's titlywink stuff but because we're not a people and see, the thing about it, I tried to reach out to the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. They don't write back. They don't, they don't respond to nothing. So I don't beg folks or whatever. I sit back in the cut and just keep watching you do what you do. And you continue to go down in flames. Then you want to get angry at me because I'm sitting back in the cut and I said, I, I told you so. But if you want to go to Africa, that's your business. The majority ain't interested. They're not interested. They don't know about no Africa. You might as well make them Chinese. That's a foreign culture. Over 50 nations. All types of religions. All types of languages. They have no idea. They don't have no idea of what that, that's about. You might as well send them to, to, to China somewhere. Uh, uh, Australia. They, we, we don't know nothing about that. And a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. this, this is the example that I give you. Like I told you. I was born in Mississippi. We can't, Our people, the majority, a lot of our, my people 
came to the North in the early 1970s. This is 2023. I asked the children, do y'all want to go and visit, you know, where we was raised? They look at me like, oh, Mississippi, I don't care. They don't care. They don't care nothing about it. They care about where they live right now. What we going to do here, where I live right now. They don't care about where we come from. They don't care. Now, some little children might be interested in history. Like me, I want to go. I want to go see what great grandpa and them live. You know, some children are interested in like that. But a lot of these youngsters, they're not interested. They don't care. So they don't care if you came from Africa. They said they'll be smoking their weed. That's cool. How got it, brother? <laughs> you ready to go go back to Africa? <laughs> go back what? Anyway, you crazy going back to Africa? You crazy? But your grandparents, your grandparents and I, that's them. I don't even know what that damn Africa. And they go, look, 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 nigga, hit this, hit this, hit this. They don't care. That's so you're not being realistic with the people. That's realistic for a certain group who have a certain mentality, which is small. The majority don't care because they don't know nothing about that. They don't know. And then, like I said, Africa is a relative term. If you're going to go back to Africa and deal with Africa, who are you talking about? Who are you dealing with? You, you trying to deal with the whole continent? That's not, that's not realistic. Because a lot of people in Africa don't even like you. And they will tell you in your face. I saw a video and the brother and sister was buying food in the, in the, in the market and, and they was telling them they was charging them more than the average African. And the sister yeah. was like, that's not fair. I'm an African. They said, no, you're not. They said, you white man. I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they know all, all they really care about is, is, that, is that you bring the American dollar. Exactly. They don't, they don't think of us as Africans. They just care about the American dollar. Why don't these go to Africa people, go to them places that's not Europeanized? Because a lot of these places where they go to is it's basically Europeanized. They speak English and, and they try to live like Europeans or whatever. And the price to live in, in Africa is, woo, it's not cheap. And on top of that, the people, a lot of people really don't like you. And like somebody like me, I might be able to go to the Congo somewhere and I might be able to fit in if I change, change the accent. I might be able to blend in with them because of my physical appearance. The average black American, they know you don't look like them. Can't blend in. Mm -hmm. That's not real. So that's not realistic for us. Mm -hmm. That's not. It's not a realistic. That's you've turned that into a religious. It's not religion, but basically that's what it is. You turn it into a religion. It's not realistic. Right. So I mean, if that's what you feel you need to do, then do it. But mm -hmm. I'm staying with the majority. The majority ain't going and will never go to no Africa. And the only way you can be an African is the same way that you are born again. You have to be born again. And the only way you can be born again to be an African, if that's what you think that's what you are. Me, I'm perfectly fine being a soul brother. I'm perfectly fine being a black American. I'm perfectly fine being a foundation of black American. I'm perfectly fine just being who I am in this country. But the only way you can be an African, you have to take your children there, pick out a tribe of people that you want them to be with, and then their children will be born in Africa, and then generations, then they will become Africans. That's the only way. But you, you will never be an African. Never, because you, you never was there you never was there. You have nothing to do with that continent. You can believe whatever you want to. If you are African, then like that, then you should automatically have citizenship somewhere. Because these people, when they go home and they're black, they don't have to worry about citizenship because they that's they, they citizens automatically. You ain't automatically a citizen nowhere in Africa. 
you got to go through the process like you an immigrant. Mm -hmm. If you are African, why do you have to go through the process of being a citizen of citizenship? If you if you so African, mm -hmm. I'll take my chances right here. And actually, right here is much better. You're in a better position than those people. Those people, some of them are risking their life trying to go to Europe, trying to come where you at. It don't make any sense. But I have no problem with brothers and sisters that want to go to Africa. You know, but, but maybe if we do the Mississippi campaign, when you go to Africa, then maybe you can, since you're over there already, you can help us set up trade, you know, Im import uh, goods and offer services since you're there. So you could be like an ambassador since you're already there. So I mean, it still it still would be some benefit, but again, you have to right. look at this realistically. We as a people, and you got to look at it. It's over forty million brothers and sisters in this country I'm not going to no Africa. That's just that's not realistic. It's just not. Mm hmm. Exactly. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, um, what do you think about like since maybe like the sixties or seventies? You know, in the black community, it's a lot of different foreign ideologies like Muslim and Hebrew Israelites and Hoteps and indigenous Americans and all of this other stuff. Do you feel like this stuff has poisoned us and made us like a little more divisive? All of these foreign ideologies and cultures that we've been trying to take on? A lot of these things, they made their appearance in the late 1920s and 1930s. Now we have to understand this. Our ancestors basically just got off the slave plantation. In the 1920s and the 1930s, people who were actual slaves were still alive. The last known child of a slave died in 2002. The child of a slave. Mm. But in the 1920s and the 1930s, there were actual brothers and sisters who actually know what it was like to be on a slave plantation, who were still alive in their 80s and 90s, some going on 100. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, as a people, we were illiterate. As a people, we were ignorant. And we didn't know. As a people, we were oppressed. The 1920s, 1930s, whatever, somebody put up a map about the lynchings all over this country. So we had to work. I had a reverend friend. May he rest in peace. My reverend friend told me he saw his friend lynched. And if he had been made a little bit of noise, he might have been lynched too. He saw his friend be lynched. Can you imagine that? And he was a preacher. He put it all in the hands of Jesus. But we have to understand that in the 1920s, 1930s, so there was a feeling among our ancestors because the only thing they knew was being an American. That's all they knew. They came from the slave plantation. They trying to be American. But they was living under oppression. So people like Marcus Garvey and others start coming out of the woodworks and began telling these stories. You know, you are God. You know, the white man's the devil. A lot of people was attracted to that. God gonna punish them for what they've done to us. We are the chosen people. Here you are off a slave plantation, living under oppression, and somebody come to you with these stories like that. It is attract that attract folks. Mm -hmm. Your 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 economics is all messed up because they just you you discriminated against. And just like see, and just like the story of Jesus. We didn't question 
what the slave master was teaching us. Even to this day, we really don't. We don't question the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus mm -hmm. died for our sins. Remember that, boys. Jesus died for your sin. Remember that now. So the same way we took the slave master for his word, when Marcus Garvey came with his teaching, when Noah Drew Ali and others, when they come out the woodwork with their teaching, we took it for face value because that helped us deal with, with our oppression. Because God is on our side. We don't get ours for a change. God stand with us. Who wouldn't want that? And that's where it comes from. That's why we gravitated towards that. And it gave us an identity. Because you, you knew legally, if under the law, you knew that you was an American. But I'm a, I'm a Moor. I come from the tribe of Shabazz. You know, it gave us some kind of identity. Because you didn't want to be associated with these people that was kicking your butt every day. I don't want to be no American. I'm a Moor. I'm a Hebrew Israelite. I'm not no American. I'm a Moor. So we took all these things on face value. We didn't question nothing. And this is not to say this wasn't a good thing. Because those teachings and those act, that activity actually helped us to move forward. But see, it goes back to our development. When you're a baby, you drink milk. You don't eat steak. You don't eat steak and eggs. You drink milk. And you can't even walk. You crawl. So in the 1920s and the 1930s, you're dealing with the people who crawling. Who don't have nothing. You're not even born. You're just searching. And so these teachers give us something. Give us some kind of guidance. And that's why we was attracted to them. But as time goes on, you got to evolve. You got to grow. You can't stay a child. Just like when I talk about these, these religious teachings. They call themselves sheep. Sheep is known as a dumb animal. A sheep needs a shepherd. Need, always needs something to follow. And a sheep is docile. And that's how we act. And the religious folks call themselves the children of God. You can't stay a child forever. You got to grow up. So see, this is the problem. These things won't allow us to grow. We needed those things. They helped us in the 1920s, 1930s, 1950s, whatever. But we got to continue to, to grow. If these things don't allow us to grow, then we need to let them go. They holding you back. They keeping you in the crib. That's one of the words that we used to use in the 1970s. <laughs> they keeping you in the crib. And what is a crib? A crib is where babies sleep. They won't let us grow. So here we are in 2023, still thinking, still doing, still trying to act like it's 1920s, 1930s. We have we the the teachings don't the, the teachings don't well it's maybe not really the teachings. Our understanding of the teachings don't allow the people to grow to their potential. Mm -hmm. You're still on the baby bottle. You're still on the Similac. It won't let you grow. So you are, so here you are in 2023 and you can't even replicate what Marcus Garvey did. You can't even replicate what Noah Drew Ali or any of these other People from the 20s and the 30s done. You can't replicate it. You're more educated. You have more money. You have the you have social media. And you can't even replicate. And they were babies. A lot of those people in the 1920s and 30s couldn't even read and write. And we educated. We read lots of books, you know. 
We love books. I'm getting two bookshelves. I might put some books behind me. I'm real smart. I read a lot of books. <laughs> you know, a lot of brothers, they come on video, they make sure you see all their books. Yeah. I'm very smart. I read a lot of books. Look at look at your condition. You're reading a lot of books, but they're not doing nothing to change your condition. You still in a worse shape. Matter of fact, even this Caucasian man, this 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 uh Jewish guy, Tim Wise. Tim Wise say the black community is in a worse shape than it was during the time of Dr. King. This is coming from a white Jewish guy. So what does that tell you? What does that tell you? And unfortunately, I was in denial. But I started thinking about it, but I was in denial and I, I was hoping I was wrong. But I, get, I began to find out and began to learn that people with this mindset of black conscious, the Pan-African mindset, the Nation of Islam mindset, the more science to a mindset and the comedic mindset and Hebrew Israelite and the list goes on and on. They are against our unity. The one, the very ones that's talking about black unity and black love, they are the ones who really aren't about that. And you see them. They're not even unified with each other. All of them are doing their own thing. All these go back to Africa groups. They're not trying to go back to Africa. He trying to go to Africa his way. She trying to go back to Africa that way. All of them. There's no unity among them. And their leadership know that that stuff is not going nowhere so they use their followers just so they can live good. A lot of these leaders of these different YouTube channels and these different movements, the leadership, the one who's running the show, they living in mansions, driving these fancy cars and all this kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. They ain't going nowhere. And I began to notice that. When I was in the Nation of Islam, we had a, a interdenominational meeting. I love that meeting. Everybody was there. Moors was there. Israelites was there. Christians, atheists, agnostics. Everybody was there. It was a real good meeting. The Minister Farrakhan talked. That was a real good meeting. And we got back to the mosque about 9, 10 o'clock and we had a, a after meeting. And I'm like, I was fired up. I'm like, that's good. Black people really getting together. Oh, huh. I got back to the mosque and in the after meeting, the lieutenant got up before the Fruit of Islam, the FOI. He said, do you see how the people want to follow us? They're waiting on us. We're their leaders. I'm like, that ain't what I got from the meeting. I thought we was all there, all there together. You know, all of us work together to come up with a solution. Brother, the people are thirsty for us. All of us need to become ministers. All the brothers and sisters gonna come and wanna follow us. I, that ain't what I heard. What meeting you was at, man? <laughs> A lot of them, that's how they think. Just like that. You are a sincere brother and you thinking that you're trying to unite with somebody and then they go home they go behind closed doors. You see that myth detector brother? He ready to follow us. He, he right there. He want to come. He want to come. He, he's looking for our leadership. That's what they do. That's what they do. But that's not what you was about. You was there sincerely looking for brotherhood. How can we sit together and solve this problem once and for all? But that's not how they think. You're going to be a Pan-African. You're going to be a Hebrew Israelite. You're going to be a Moor. That's what it's all about for them. They're not about, they're not about the people. Because 
realistically, the people are not going to be those things. But realistically, the people are going to be American citizens. That's realistically. That's what they're gonna. That's what they're gonna be. And that's what your happy ass, whether you like it or not, that's what you are. You can call yourself a Muslim mm -hmm. or a comedic, or you can call yourself anything you want to. When your happy ass go to the airport, uh, American citizen is, is there. When you go to the other country, mm -hmm. they're gonna identify you as an American citizen. Oh no, I'm a Moor. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to take your Moor ass back where you come from, cause, cause apparently mm -hmm. you got a counter. You got a counterfeit passport or something, cause uh, we don't know nothing about your your nation. You need to go somewhere else with that. Matter of fact, you might get in trouble for that, for for, for some kind of fraud. What, what kind of you a Hebrew Israelite citizen of a Hebrew name? What the hell are you talking about? Cause you ain't no you ain't you ain't you have to be sovereign in order to make that claim. You're not you're an American damn citizen. Mm -hmm. So that's not realistic. So from the so from my point of view, from my position, I have to look at things from a realistic. It doesn't make any. I mean, I love the thought of those things, the thought of our own nation and where everything is beautiful in our own way. I you know I, I'm, I'm into all that, but it's it's not realistic. It's mm -hmm. it's not realistic. It's not realistic for me to believe that people are going to think like you and I. Because you're the myth detector. Mm -hmm. That means you're searching for the real. You know, mm -hmm. what, what is this stuff? Man? <laughs> you know, what you talking about, bro? <laughs> you, know, you question things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we question things, a lot of us that question things, and we don't mean no harm, but we just question things when things don't make no damn sense. Right, right. And your explanation don't make no sense. I know you believe in what you're talking about, but it, 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 don't, it don't make no sense. So they get angry at you. Mm -hmm. They get angry at me and you because we ask them about something that don't make no sense because in reality, they know it don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But they want to be loyal to the myth. They want to be loyal to the yeah. fantasy. They want to be loyal to the fairy tale, which has yeah. gotten us where? It has gotten us nothing. It has not gotten us in nowhere. Now, if it was doing something for us, I would be like, "Damn, that's that's a bunch of baloney." But damn, it's, it's got we, they got it going on. I have to give you credit, mm -hmm. but you don't have it going on. That's the problem. You're going down. If you can't go any lower, you're going down mm -hmm. and you stay down. Fifty years of this stuff. Okay, how long has YouTube been up uh, since 2005? I believe. Then all the black mm -hmm. conscious, all this black stuff start coming or whatever. And YouTube, we've been on YouTube since 2005. What has it done for us? It has done nothing for us. A lot of people, before, before monetization, a lot of people used to come on YouTube. I'm smarter than you. That's what it was all about because money wasn't involved. They just want to show I'm smarter than you. Look at all these books. I know I'm smarter than you. How many books you got, mm -hmm. Mr. Myth? How many books you got? I've been reading books for 35, 50 years. That's what it was about. But now it's about the money. It's about the subscribers. I, I got, I got 500,000 subscribers. I, uh, I, you know, I, I, you, you know, I got. That's what it's all about now. Mm -hmm. And the people accept that. A lot of people are. I mean, folks just don't know any better. They just don't. That's why mm -hmm. I don't get upset. I don't get angry. They just don't know no better. They're not like me and you. Mm -hmm. I've always been, I've always been a person that questions things that don't make any sense. I've always been. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. Like I've, I've always had a problem with religion, even when I was a Christian boy. I always had a problem, but I just didn't know what the problem was. But I always knew it was a problem. Mm -hmm. But I went to church, praise Jesus, and then I was introduced to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. That sounded better because Elijah Muhammad, they was talking all that blackly black stuff, and I like hearing that. that and mm -hmm. black, black man, white man, the devil. I'm like, whoo, yes, I like that. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, but it, what has it done? Make you feel good. Mm -hmm. Make you make you feel good. And again, it has brought us some benefit. It, it has brought us some type of success. 
but it has not solved our problem. We are in a position of like a dog chasing his tail. We're just going round and round. We'll never be able to catch that tail. We just round and round, round. I, brother, am sick of this. We need to stop this once and for all. We need to stop this. We need to stop this tail chasing. Stop straightening up. Now we need to move forward. Religion itself is, is a dog chasing his tail. How long have God and the devil been fighting? What, for the last few thousand years? <laughs> like, damn, that's a long fight. Mm -hmm. When you go to most fights, you know, round one, round two, they last for whatever, that's the end of the fight. The devil and God been fighting for a thousand years. No end in sight. Like, mm -hmm. God damn. It's like a cartoon. Right. Batman been fighting the Joker since the 1930s. Superman been fighting mm -hmm. Lex Luthor since the 1940s. Popeye been fighting Bluto since the 1930s. Tom and Jerry been fighting like, damn. You know, it just goes on and on. That's the cycle that we're in. Brothers and sisters, ain't y'all tired? tired of this? Every year, the white man do this, white man do that. Like, God, every year, white people done done something. White man do this, the white man do that. Damn. When is it going to stop? I'm going to tell you when it's going to stop. It's going to stop when you we begin to mature, grow up, and take our destinies our hand, in our hands and become the men and the women that you claim that you are. That's when it's going to stop. Mm -hmm. And people begin to respect you. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about them uh, um, uh, respecting you, talking about calling you boy. No, you know you what you're dealing with. You can call me anything you want to. Mm -hmm. But when you deal with this one, you better come strong. What they say in the hood, uh, 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 it take ass to get some ass. I forgot how that's forgot exactly mm -hmm. how that go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you gotta uh, yeah, you gotta take some ass whoopings before you give it up or something like that. Yeah, something to that effect. But you know, we, we got to we got to bring it. So so I want I want to circle back to <clears throat> the whole uh, since you said used to be a used to be a nation of Islam. Let's talk about, uh, do you feel like Farrakhan is a true leader or is he a fraud with cons like the Million Man March and uh, she talk a little bit about Elijah Muhammad, uh, you know, you feel his teachings were good or is he a legit leader and the whole Malcolm X situation going on with that? Well, you put, that's, that's a whole program in itself right there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But... I cannot call Louis Farrakhan. He's a leader for his organization. He's not a leader for us as a people. Mm -hmm. He's a leader for his church because that's all that it is. It's a church. The Nation of Islam is not a it's not a militant organization. It's about the spread of Islam. Thus, the name. Nation of Islam has nothing to do with revolutionaries, has nothing to do with that. And if you go to their website, they will tell you what they are. They will tell you what the purpose of the FYI, the fruit of Islam, they will tell you what that's about. They will tell you the fruit of Islam, their mission is to spread Islam, not to Fight for the justice of the black man in America and liberate you. That's not what their purpose is. Their purpose is to convert you to a foreigner's religion. We don't have a religion. All our religion comes from somebody else. God has never visited the black American, so brothers and sisters in this country. Never. Our God is Allah. Allah does not origin in, a, in, in Mississippi or Alabama, Tennessee, or uh, West Virginia. A lot of origins in the Middle East, we ain't never been there. Some sucker got on a passport, came to America, and brought that to us. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not American. Jesus comes from the Middle East. And I don't know how the slave master got it, but he got it, then the slave master gave it to us, blah, 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 blah. All our religions, all our beliefs, 
all our spirituality, none of it is self-discovered. It came from some kind of foreigner somewhere. It's their stuff, and we, we believe their stuff. We never talk about how God revealed him or herself to us because they never done. Mm -hmm. We get the leftovers from some other people. And they tell us who God is. Why God can't give up, can't come to us. Either, either God don't like us or he don't exist. I wonder mm -hmm. the other. I it, say. It like it's cool. Yeah, go ahead, bro. It seems like you're always talking to people. It seems like you're always talking to people in the Middle East. Yeah, in the Middle East. I've never heard. <laughs> when you going to come to Jackson, Mississippi, God? <laughs> I will rent the hotel and set up the meeting, God. You can come to Jackson, Mississippi and talk to us. Mm -hmm. God never talked to us. I always sent some sucker from overseas. Mm -hmm. We ain't never been there. And then when you look at the Bible and Quran, they have these European names or Arabic names. Like, what's up, with, what's up, what's up, what's up there? Why is God always coming to these Middle Eastern folks? Can't never talk to us. I'm not, I'm not into that. But Farrakhan, his purpose, well, first of all, the reality is Louis Farrakhan was broke. That's the reality of it. After the Nation of Islam mm -hmm. fell or whatever, he was broke. He was a washed up musician. Mm -hmm. Trying to get back in entertainment, but you know, you've been out there for so long, nobody don't care about you like that no more. And you know, you was washed up or whatever. And his friend, uh, Bernard Kushmir, hey man, you know, hey, we ain't got nothing to lose. Why don't we try to rebuild Elijah Muhammad teaching? Because they knew that there was a lot of people who wanted to see that come back again. Mm -hmm. I know in my neighborhood, the people was happy to see the brothers, the brothers back with the bow ties and stuff. I mean, they, we was real, real welcome in the 1980s. People was happy to see y'all back, y'all back. I'm like, okay, we back. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. Farrakhan used that because he didn't have no choice. Because that's all that he knew. That was his hustle. And. I mean, you don't blame him. I mean, he took advantage of his his oratory, his charisma. You know, you know, he's the the charmer. He used to call himself <laughs> he, he used to call himself the charmer back, you know, in the day when he was a calypso singer. Yeah. You, you can yeah. find you can find him very charming. He used to laugh about it a lot. He's very charming. He even got my mother. My mother don't like nobody. I like Farrakhan. He's all right. Because he's, he's charming. Very charming soul. <laughs> and when you listen to him, he's a great orator. He's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and especially when you got all that religious God stuff in your head and the way he be talking. Mm -hmm. And God and the, the black man and the blow on him. You be like, yes, Father God. How much money do you want? <laughs> like any other preacher. Mm -hmm. But he's a preacher. He's not a revolutionary. Matter of fact, to my knowledge, he know he's never really hung out with revolutionaries. Unlike Malcolm X. Malcolm X, as you know, he hung out with people like Fidel Castro and a lot of people that was actually fighting these these, these uh, uh races. Louis mm -hmm. Farrakhan has never done that except I think the closest he ever come to, I think, was Muammar Gaddafi, probably. That was they was friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Farrakhan shut the hell up when they start dropping bombs on uh, <laughs> my mom. <Kandavi. laughs> he, he don't want none of that action. Uh, I, I, be, he yeah, got, I, he, I noticed that. I noticed that after after Gaddafi went down, you ain't hear no, you ain't hear too much about him and all that military. So. He got real quiet after that. I don't want none of that. Get all that. <laughs> but he he's a good preacher, and Minister Farrakhan is a good motivator. But he has no, he has no. Vision. His vision is something that's outdated. What he got from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he really don't even know how to to apply it. 
See, this is the thing about knowledge also. It's good to know about a lot of things. But if you don't know how to apply it, it don't mean nothing. It means nothing. Like you said, I'm the black man is God. That's good knowledge. That's good to say. How do I apply that? You black man and God, and you waiting for food stamps. Black man is God, mm -hmm. and you don't control no resources. You under, you still under the foot of, of another man. But you you God. How the hell you God? Yeah, um, so I used to, um, I wouldn't say I used to be a whole part of the Nation of Islam, but mm -hmm. I went through the classes, you know, where you got to sit in there, then, you know, you got to write the letter in yeah. cursive to, uh, I went through that, then I passed, but, uh, you know, they kind of, I kind of left the class because, you know, they was asking me to, like, repeat the lessons and everything, and I said, I asked them, the Supreme Captain, I said, how can the black man be God when we this and that, and the Quran said only a lot of God, they, uh, they uh they got quiet. Then they were like, oh, "Don't worry about that." And they were like, "Don't worry about that. We're just gonna give you a little milk right now. We'll answer that later." Yeah, like, that that sounds like. Tell me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah, I, I, so yeah, I, I left after that because I, you know, they couldn't answer that question. So I left after that. Then I feel like they was being secretive, talking about some give you a little milk now. So I left. A, a, well, a lot of questions that's being raised now, they didn't have to deal with. Back in the past. Because like I said, our people was illiterate. It was ignorant. They just took things on face value. But now we live in the age of information. And it's a whole different ball game. A lot of people are not going to take things on face value. They want to, to know. Because certain things don't make any, make any sense. It don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. The nation of Islam called the white man the devil. But their God is supposed to be a half breed. He's half devil. But they justify, well, uh, his mother, she's white, but she's, she's a different kind of white. You know, she, she's still a white woman. Well, what do you mean she's a different kind of white? They try to, they don't, they try to explain it. How do, how do you explain that? Yeah. And, and the image, yeah. the image of Master Farah Muhammad is no different than white Jesus. Mm -hmm. At least the, 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 the Christians that put white Jesus on the wall... They have all different kinds of versions of white Jesus. The Nation of Islam have this only one picture of Master Farah Muhammad. One. And it's not even a picture. It's a painting. I'm like, mm -hmm. they didn't have no cameras in 1930s? Well, the FBI mm -hmm. got pictures of Master Farah Muhammad that they don't want to claim. And they got lots of pictures <laughs> of Master Farah Muhammad. The FBI yeah. and, and the Detroit Police Department. That ain't Master Farah Muhammad. How do you know? <laughs> yeah. But there wasn't a lot yeah, of questioning. Definitely. There wasn't a lot of questioning of these teachings until recently, until the age of information. Because now you don't have to go to the library. You can just sit back on your computer and Google a whole lot of stuff up. A lot of basic stuff up. You don't have to mm -hmm. you don't have to even go to the mm -hmm. library. And I debunk refute them all the time. I said, yeah. You just, just go to Google, blah, 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 pow. You wrong. They just like, they try to explain it. Uh, well, the, no, you just wrong. That ain't, like something like this. In How to Eat to Live, the Nation of Islam, you're not supposed to eat peanuts, right? You know that much, right? Mm -hmm. They teach don't eat peanuts because nuts take five years off your life. I'm pretty sure you heard of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they don't eat, including the peanuts. That's mm -hmm. supposed to be a nut. But uh, see, mm -hmm. the peanut is not a nut. Mm -hmm. The peanut is a lagoon. It's an underground pea. It's not a nut. Nuts come from trees. No nuts mm -hmm. grow under the ground. They come from trees. Mm -hmm. And when I mm -hmm. tell them that, and then on top of that, how do you calculate? <laughs> how do you calculate if you eat, eat every time you eat nuts, it takes five years of your life. How do you calculate that? Because first of all, in order to calculate that, you have to know how long you're going to live. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Right. So that's the only way that you can calculate. Oh, wow. Damn. I took five years off my life because I ate some peanuts. Yeah. How do you yeah, calculate yeah, that? 
And they used to say that, uh, you know, when you fast, uh, only you once a day, they used to say that every day you fast is a, another year, another extra year or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, something like that. You know, it's... And then, and then they used to say that, then they used to say that, uh, Master Farrar and Muhammad uh, went up into a spaceship or something like <laughs> that. But, but then, but then you got an interview with, uh, one of Muhammad Ali ex-wife. She said he, he was staying... He stayed with Elijah Muhammad in his mansion until he was an old age. Yeah. I heard that interview. Yeah. So. But when people want to believe something, they're just going to believe. It don't make no difference what somebody say, what information that, that you bring. They're just going to believe. Because like I said, mm -hmm. it's all taken on face value anyway. Now, I didn't know no better. I joined the Nation of Islam. First of all, I was a child. I was just hyped up mm -hmm. by the teaching. I didn't question the teaching. I didn't question the teaching. I didn't. Well, I, I did to a certain point. Sometimes I'm like, that don't make. You know something? If you if you if you go back into the Malcolm X archives, you never really. I don't know. Maybe maybe you didn't heard more than I have. I never really hear heard Malcolm X teach the black man is God. Mm -hmm. I never really heard him teach. About the mother plane, I never heard him teach about how to eat to live, except, except you know, you eat one meal a day, don't eat pork, or whatever, blah blah, you know, basic stuff. He didn't really get off into the, in, in, into the, into the, you know, those teachings of the Elijah Muhammad, you know, the mother plane, and the black man is God. He really didn't get off into that kind of stuff. He really stayed like sort of militant, you know, the white man is the devil, and fight against, the, you know, that's where his energy was at. He didn't really get into the teachings like that. Now, Minister Farrakhan, you can go find his video. He done science up everything. How the black man is God, where black come from, all these old dumb stuff. You know? And the thing about it is, you know, people listen to listen to that stuff. They're not they're not critical thinking because a lot of stuff just don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And the mother plane. Ain't showed up yet. Every time there's a story about a UFO, that's the mother plane. That's the no, no, sir. That's a UFO. That ain't no mother plane. UFO means unidentified flying object. That's what UFO means. Mm -hmm. If it was the mother plane, they would have said that that must be the Muslim's mother plane. <laughs> it has not shown up in 90 years. You waiting on the mother plane, no different than Christians waiting on the return of Jesus. Matter of fact, Louis mm -hmm. Farrakhan has them waiting on the return of Elijah Muhammad. Right. Elijah Muhammad is not right. dead. They say he up on the mothership there <laughs> or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, if that's what you want to believe, that you see, my thing would get me in a lot of trouble is that I have to challenge those things. And people get angry. I, I, yeah, I got the right to believe it. Yes, you do. But if you put it out into the public, people have the right to challenge what you say. Mm -hmm. If you keep it to yourself, I can't, I can't challenge you because I don't know what the hell you. I don't know what you believe. And you're keeping it to yourself. But if you make videos and you come out here in the public trying to teach people, the public is going to challenge you. In 2023. And also what I noticed is that, you know, it's a different day and age now. You know, everybody can question them and ridicule them. But it seemed like, it seemed like back in the day, you you try to question the NOI or slander the name of Elijah Muhammad, they'll try to kill you from from, from, from what I read, from what I heard back in yeah. the day. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really still no different today because who knows how many times mm -hmm. these folks, are. I've been threatened in the, in the mosque two times. I wasn't going to try for number three. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to try for number yeah. three. I'm just trying to be a brother. Come there, listen to the lecture, buy some bean pies, and and, and, and say, how you doing, brother, and leave. They want to make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, brother, when you going to come back to the Nation of Islam? Uh, I told you I don't believe in that no more. I'm just here mm -hmm. just to be brotherly. I brought some guests with me. We listened to the teachings, buy some bean pies. Maybe there's a fine sister I can holler at real quick, you know. Then we we leaving. That's that's what we doing. 
They want to interrogate me. When you going to come back? Brother, you know you still believe in Allah. Uh, didn't I tell you? Didn't you understand the words coming from my mouth, sir? I said, I don't believe in that no more. And sometimes, sometimes I still dress like I'm a Muslim. I have my bow tie. I have my FOI lapel pin and things of this nature. And I remember uh, I went to the mosque one time and one of the brothers said, well, since you don't believe in the teachers no more, uh, you don't deserve to wear that, that, that lapel pin. You know, we should take that from you. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, oh, here we go. I said, oh, no, no. I said, look, <clears throat> first of all, bro, you try to take my lapel pin. We're we going to have some real big problems here. Now, if they gave me that lapel pin, no big deal. There you go. I would have gave it. I would have gave it back to him a long time ago. I paid. I paid for this. The Nation of Islam didn't give me nothing. I was with, I was with Louis Farrakhan for nine years. Didn't even get a free ink pen. The best thing I got out of out of that was some burnt up bean pies, and they had me sleeping on pickle barrels. They didn't give me nothing. And this sucker going to tell me that he going to take my... I said, bro, I start balling up my fist and everything. <laughs> we, we, it's going to be some big trouble up in this in the house of God today. <laughs> May Allah be with whoever. Because you ain't taking my, my pen. Because I paid for it. I paid for this tie. The nation, Farrakhan don't give you nothing. All those suits, those overcharged suits that them brothers be wearing, Farrakhan mm -hmm. don't buy his people, give his people nothing. Absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. You got to go in your own pocket and buy all those pretty suits that the brothers be wearing. I ain't talking about the, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the, you know, just a regular suit with a bow tie. I'm talking about those FOI uniforms. You got to mm -hmm. go in your own pocket. I don't, I don't know how much those uniforms cost. They're not cheap. Farrakhan mm -hmm. don't give, Farrakhan don't give you a dime. Nothing. So, 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 what is Farrakhan doing with all the money he get to fly jets out of town, out the country, and all the money from the Million Man March? What, how is he? What is he doing with all the money? Well, it goes back to to who he is. He's just a preacher, and he's incompetent. He's an incompetent person. He's just a preacher. You get the money, mm -hmm. and you know whatever, wherever the wind blows, basically, you know. And he, nobody holds him accountable. So the money can just be messed. It's just like, it's just like the government of these states. Mm -hmm. Who is keeping an eye on the states, how they spend, or even the federal government? Who is keeping a check on how they blow the money, what they do with the with the with, with taxpayers' money? Mm -hmm. So he's not held accountable for nothing. He even kissed the white man in the mouth and they didn't say nothing about it. Mm. In public. They talk about the minister didn't. You're lying. It's public right there. Lying, lying, and he even said it. I I kissed the, the father Flager. And he, my, my brother, uh, Father Flager. And he said, uh, there's, <laughs> and there's nothing gay about it. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> nothing gay. Now you know something was wrong because normally when Farrakhan says something to talk, the audience go, Go oh, Farrakhan! I'm with you, Farrakhan! I just, I just, I just love me some Farrakhan! I just, you, you miss, miss, what you call yourself, myth detective? You, you, you can kick rock! Farrakhan! I, I love you, Farrakhan! I love you! I just, and these, these the men, they ain't the women, these are the men. Go ahead, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. They be going crazy. But when Minister Farrakhan kissed that, that father flag in the mouth, you could hear the clap. The clap was like, <laughs> the videos on YouTube, they, they was like, and then Farrakhan cleaned it up, you know, and I, I kissed my the father flagger and there's nothing gay about it. And and they was clapping like this. <laughs> I said, yo, 
y'all a bunch of yeah, y'all a bunch of chumps. <laughs> y'all a bunch of chumps because I'm gonna tell you outright. If I was still in the nation and saw him do that, I would have went ballistic. I said, hey, what's up with this? <laughs> what's up with that? You know. And then come to find mm -hmm. out, the rumors about Farrakhan was true that he would been cheating on his wife for years and. He got all these other outside children. That's true. Uh, that that lecture that he did, uh, what they call it, the Swan Song, whatever. He even admitted. Mm -hmm. He says, very difficult to have more than one wife, woman. Uh, I, I couldn't go past three. <laughs> I thought you didn't. Have, I thought I thought this man didn't cheat on his wife. I didn't. I, we thought, and nobody didn't do nothing. Nobody didn't said nothing about. It. He said it out of his own mouth. But the rumor was already out that he was messing on. He was messing on his wife even before he lifted up the nation. He was already out there. Uh, there was rumors he messed with Lola Falana. It was rumors that he messed with mm. Stephanie Mills. It's rumors that he messed with that actress Melba Moore, you know, and some others. Mm. And, and some Mexican woman. He got Mexican children. All these rumors was out a long time ago. But he messed around. I guess he getting close to, you know, getting close to the glory, so I guess he decided to go ahead and admit something. He said, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard having three three wives or, or whatever he wanna call. Them. You ain't married to no women, you don't have no no marriage certificate anymore. They they call all these women wives. They don't have no you don't have no marriage certificate with none of these women. Like Elijah Muhammad, they talk about yeah. him and his wives. Elijah Muhammad had only one wife, Sister Clara Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And the other women, well, actually, some of them was a girl, because we know, because we know that one of them actually was a teenager. She was 15 years old, uh, Ola Muhammad. She was 15 years old and had two children by Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. It's estimated, it's estimated that Elijah Muhammad had over 30 children. Mm -hmm. But they know about 22, but it's estimated that he had over 30. Mm-hmm. He took advantage of the women that was around, those young women, those secretaries. And see, they fell, they saw him as this, you know, I'm getting close to God. Mm -hmm. Come on in here to God's room, girl. Come on, come on in here. <laughs> just, just, come on in across the God. God wants to give you a little something. Come on, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Then later oh, on, man. then la later on, oh God, oh God, <laughs> that's probably why he died early. Oh God, from a heart attack, yeah. messing with them a young chick. <laughs> but the women went for it because, yeah, so. because they they close to to, to 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 you know they getting close to to God. just like a lot of people they get close to Michael Jackson, you know. Oh Michael Jackson, yeah. Oh Michael, Jackson. you know it's, it's no different. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he had he had those young girls. I, I haven't had I, I, I haven't had that experience myself yet. <laughs> I haven't had that experience. They 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 usually run from me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he uh yeah he had them young girls brainwashed. Yeah, like, uh, like I remember uh, the mil the Million Man March. So I went there. Mm -hmm, I did I too. I guess they're supposed to be. I guess they're supposed to be addressing all the rumors of uh, Elijah Muhammad having teenage wives. So all his wives got up on stage, and all they said was that we his wives, and uh, and that we love him. They ain't state their age when they met him. Never. So I'm like, what's no. the point of that? What y'all get on stage? No, no, they did. What y'all get on stage for? We, I was like, what y'all get on stage for? We wanted to know how old y'all were when y'all when y'all got with him, not how y'all feel. Like, exactly. And they didn't bring no marriage certificates either, so. No, nothing. They None of that. And that's just a few. That was just a few of them. Uh, that's just a few of the, the, the sisters. They didn't, they didn't get all of them. Mm. That was just a mm. few of, of them, of the of the women. Oh, yeah. But anyway, no marriage certificates. They didn't prove. Uh, mm. He's such a beautiful man. And, and, you know, they just still, even as an older woman, they still happy. That you know they spread their legs for Elijah Muhammad, you know. <laughs> this this old man probably old enough to be your great your grandfather or your great grandfather. You know that's cult that's cult behavior. Yeah, it is. And these yeah. women, as old as they are, they still caught up in that. Still caught up. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And the thing about it, brother, is these the 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 children from these relationships supposed to be <clears throat> special. These children are grown now. What have they done? What what do they do special? They ain't done nothing. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for Farrakhan, most of them you wouldn't even know nothing about them at all. Period. They ain't done nothing on their own. Mm -hmm. Farrakhan is the one that introduced some of these children or whatever. They haven't done nothing special. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the people that actually uplifted the nation of Islam and made the nation of Islam what it was didn't come from, from his flesh. Malcolm wasn't his biological son, nor Farrakhan, or, none, or, or Rasul, or none of these other ministers. They wasn't, mm -hmm. they wasn't from his, uh, his, his biological flesh. His, his children actually they ain't done nothing none of his seed has done nothing you know only one that we really know of that actually participated in trying to do something in that was, was Wallace that's mm -hmm. it and that's it you don't, you don't get nothing from there's nothing special about his his spirit. another thing I noticed a few people a few people were brought up well, from the exception of Khalid Muhammad, it seems like all the nation of Islam leaders really is, is light skinned people. Uh oh. You know, they're all over. Farrakhan addressed that one time. <laughs> and, he, and he was telling the people it's not about the color of the skin, it's about the, the, the truth of the word. Well, if that's the case, put some black faces up there with you. Cause every time you look at them, it's a bunch of just a bunch of light skinned folks. It ain't no different than what the slave master did on the slave plantation. The slave master gave the light skinned folks the position of preacher and teaching the word. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. darker ones always was the follower, always was the listener. Mm -hmm. Same thing. On the slave plantation, the white man. Ran the slave plantation. On your plantation, the light skin or the white man still continue to run the plantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dark skinned people, you talking about how the black man is God, but nobody what I know. But I know I can't control. I can't. I don't know nothing about. I barely know about politics for real. I don't know about a lot of this stuff. A lot of these brothers and sisters are experts. So, I know I can't, I can't do this by myself. And I know even the little group that I, I, would, I could get together, we, we, don't, we couldn't handle it. It's too much of a task. This is a big task to take on. Mm -hmm. Farrakhan cannot do it by himself. But he won't allow others to participate because it's all about him. That's why it's stuck where it's at. It has not grown. And when he died, that's the end of it. That's going to be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about him. It's supposed to be about the teaching. It's supposed to be about Elijah Muhammad. But really, in reality, it's not. It's about him. Mm -hmm. When he go, people are going to say, well, Farrakhan is gone. You know. Why you don't go to the, to the temple like you used to? Well, Farrakhan ain't talking. You know, he, I really don't like them other brothers. You know, it's not... That's because it's, it's not about the teaching. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's about personality. If it was about the teaching, mm -hmm. if it was about the teaching, then whether Farrakhan talk or don't talk, they should still get the same support. But that's not that's not what's going to happen. When Elijah Muhammad died, that was the end. Mm -hmm. It went down because that's what it was all about. And Elijah Muhammad could prophesy that because he understood the mentality of the of his people. But at the same time. Mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad did what he did to Malcolm. Malcolm was the best example of what you should have been because Malcolm was a self-thinker. Malcolm was able to, to go on his own. Malcolm had a vision. That's what you need to continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. But they didn't like Malcolm. They wanted a zombie. So they got rid of Malcolm Brought in Farrakhan, the perfect zombie. He's just going to be the, the, the perfect parrot and, you know, whatever. And you see what happened. Mm -hmm. 
And what Farrakhan built is not the nation of Islam. What Farrakhan built, nothing but a regular saying, you know, nothing but a church. Nothing but a church. Mm -hmm. Put on your boat. Because I was in it. And I'm like, all thing I do is go to, it's like going to church every Sunday. Put on a tie, put on a shirt, put on a suit. Go hear the, go hear the lecture that I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times. He ain't saying nothing damn new. I'm an FYI. When, when we going to have some action? When we going to Break some bones, kick some butt. When we gonna do some action? Never do. Don't I do? Want a bean pie, my brother? Want a final call newspaper, my brother? <laughs> will you come? Will you come to the mosque and listen to the Mr. Farrakhan, my brother? That's all I did. I'm like, this ain't this. Just going to church. This boring. Mm -hmm. And they always talk about the teaching. Yeah, and it wouldn't be so bad. But the teachers aren't producing nothing. Where is our hospital? Where is our clinic? Uh, where is our barbershop? You know, it's not producing nothing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's time for me to go. I got to go. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of brothers don't mm -hmm. have no respect for nobody. They want to talk to you crazy or whatever. And I'm like, uh, not me, uh, bruh. Uh, it's best for me to go because I I knock your block off. You don't mm -hmm. talk you don't talk to me that way. Mm -hmm. You don't talk to me that way. I don't I don't I don't G for that. My mama don't talk to me that way, so I doubt I don't let you talk to me that way. No, it ain't happening. Mm -hmm. So I I I, I got to go because somebody gonna get hurt, me or you. Somebody gonna get hurt, and mm -hmm. I didn't like how they was operating things because I'm out here. Telling the community we gonna do this and how great the community gonna be. We can't even do nothing for ourselves. I said, how the hell are we gonna change the community? We can't even do nothing for ourselves. Hell, I was basically, I was basically working for free. They didn't pay me nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't give me nothing. I basically was almost working for free. A lot of these old black organizations, they don't pay nobody nothing. Mm -hmm. They'll pay you little or nothing. Or a lot of brothers and sisters work volunteer. They work for free. They don't give you nothing. Mm -hmm. And taking and, and be taking in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. They can't give you nothing. Mm -hmm. And brother, I was a teenager. I never had a job. I just come out of high school. I ain't have nothing. They didn't give me nothing. Mm -hmm. I had to hustle the best way I could. So, no Farrakhan. And all this blackity black stuff, it is not good for us. Not because mm -hmm. I say so. Time has shown. Time, not me. Time has shown. It's no good for us. You mm -hmm. give credit, you give credit where it's due, and you praise the success or, or whatever, but it has not solved the problem, and it's nowhere to, to solving the problem. We are in this never-ending cycle of Tom and Jerry. And we mm -hmm. should be sick of it. We should be sick. You should be sick of calling yourself a man. And the reality is you know that your children know that everything they get comes from the white man. Directly or indirectly. I don't give a damn about your black-owned business. I don't care nothing about all this Fancy stuff that you're talking about. Go to look in your house. What do you produce? Because in my house, I didn't produce a damn thing. I think I grew, I think I grew a, a tomato plant last year. I did that. <laughs> but I didn't produce the cell phone. I didn't produce the computer or the light or, or the or the printer or the TV. I didn't produce nothing. How can you call yourself a man and you got a woman and children in your house and when they walk up and down the house, you didn't build the house. You didn't build the door. You didn't chop down a tree to make the house. See, consciously you might say, my daddy got all this from me. But subconsciously, you know all this is because of other men. Your daddy, your men didn't produce nothing. 
But you are God and a warrior. Really? That's what they don't like about me, because I'm gonna keep it real with you. How are you gonna call yourself a God and a warrior and you can you can't grow trees and build a house for yourself? Take every if the, if if you took everything away from you that you got from another man, we'd be butt naked. Pure butt naked. We ain't produce nothing. Not even socks. Mm -hmm. We'd be pure butt naked. You sh we should feel shame being a man, calling ourselves some kind of man and a god, and we, we can't even produce a pair of socks. And if we do produce a pair of socks, we are overcharged for them. Well, yeah, brother, you know, these, these, Hold up. Technical difficulties for real, my, uh, yeah. But anyway, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, we don't produce anything. So how are we gonna call? How do you? How can you call yourself a man? That's why I talk about men the way I do because it's embarrassing. You should. We should feel embarrassed being a man. Again, this is where the Mississippi campaign comes in. If we as men can pull off the Mississippi campaign, take control of a state, and you bring your wife and your children. See that mama? See that children? Look what the black man has done. Look what soul brothers we've done. See these streets? We control these streets. We make maintain these streets. See them farms? Those chickens and those ducks and those cattle? We control. We run this state. Mm -hmm. And when other people come to the state, they be like, wow. Mississippi is so clean. Everybody's so friendly. It ain't even about you being friendly. See, this is how you have to do. Just do it. Like if I meet you in the street, hey brother, what's happening or whatever? Don't have to mean it. Just do it. But that becomes it becomes real when people just keep doing it over time. And see, children don't know. They just see you doing it. And they do it to each other. How you doing, brother so and so? How you doing, sister so and so? Children don't know. Now for us, because a lot of us is we we wacky, <laughs> you know, we messed up in the head. We gotta pretend. Hey, brother, Miss Detective, how you doing, bro? I can't stand that Negro. You know, you know. But you just just go through the ritual, just go through the ritual through the practice, and pretty soon it'll get real. Especially when you produce some like Miss Detector. Look, look at our nuclear power plant we just built, bro. I said, man, I know. I told you we could have did it all the time. Yeah, when you produce something. See, when you building something, produce something with your hand. All this debating over religion and all this other garbage that we talk about, that don't mean nothing when you actually are producing things. But we mm -hmm. have a lot of time to talk wacky stuff and be negative about everything because you ain't producing nothing. What, is, what do they say in Christianity? Uh, idle hands or idle mind is the devil's workshop. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what's happening to us. Because we think we work and people tell I'm doing the work. I'm doing the work. Let me tell you something about work, bro. You know about a, you know about a, a car recall, right? Recall on cars, mm -hmm. a recall on food, yeah. recall on aspirins or whatever. Yeah. That, you know what a recall is, right? Mm -hmm. That's work. Somebody still had to produce that. Somebody still had to put in the work to produce that. But it's been recalled because the work was wrong. Something The work was defective. So just because yeah. I put in the work, we put in the work. Just because you put in the work don't mean it's the right work. It's defective. It's defective. It's ineffective. So just because we put in work don't mean that it's good. So what? You put in the work. Right. Don't, don't mean nothing. But right. see, the Mississippi campaign, the foundation which our ancestors gave us, it can work. And it can, the benefits is something that you can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. All this little tiddly wink stuff that we're talking about, that don't mean nothing compared to what you would get when you take. Do, do, I mean, can these people, can you, 
Can you comprehend what a control of a state is? Go to Google and look at how big the state of Mississippi is. And you want to control all of that. All that is what you can control. Has never been done. Has never been done. But freedom is not free. It's going to take a lot of work, real work, take a lot of sacrifice to get that done. Like I said, that's the easy part, actually. The hard part is taking it from a poverty-stricken state to a wealthy, prosperous state and maintain it, maintain it. That's the difficult part. And mm -hmm. you, with the mentality that we have right now, even if you... Even if you separate into your own neighborhood or, or a town or whatever, with the mentality that we have, it's not going to work because we have the wrong mentality because we don't, we don't like each mm -hmm. other. We don't like each other. So there's going to be problems. How are you going to build a nation and you don't even like nobody? And see, this is the thing about leadership also. Leadership should, should be about the one they can show they can they can get the job done. Not about who you like. I like him. He wear the kind of shirt that I always like. I like him, but he's incompetent, and he and he's stealing your money. It should be about who's competent. Just like when they talk about single mothers, two parent household. I would advise and I suggest, and it's a wonderful thing to have a two parent household. Mother, children, father, that kind of good stuff. But that's not the criteria. The criteria is who, who is, the, is most competent. Who is most comp competent? A mother who don't smoke and drink, going to school to get her degree, or a mother and father, two crackheads. But that's a two-parent household. Who's more competent? Who would you want your children to be with? The single mother... Or these two crackhead parents, but it's a two-parent household. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's about who's competent. It's not about the parent. Female animals for millions of years raised male and female with no problem. So how are you gonna tell me the black woman, soul sisters, can't raise male and female? You got to have this band around. What do you bring to the table? Now, I, I can't talk about everybody, but uh, there's nothing magical or special about a penis because you got a penis in the house. That don't mean nothing. So what? You got a penis in the house. There's women, married women, because I know some. There's married women taking care of their husband. Their husband is playing video games all day. Mm hmm she go to work and she come home and clean and do all that stuff too. But he's a husband and that's a two-parent household. He don't even want to babysit his own children. Can't you get a babysitter for these? You know, I got things. That I know, I know, I know, I know, and I've known men like that. But that's a two-parent household. It's about who's competent, not about... It's not about male or female, single mother, a single. There's a lot of men, and this is another thing people don't re, uh, take in consideration. Some of us, even though there was a husband and a wife in the house, some of us raised ourselves to the best of our ability. Because I know that's what happened to me. I didn't have no. My mother was there all the time, and my father was there. But basically, I raised myself. I had to learn everything the hard way. Trial and error on my own. There was no, no parents telling me uh, the birds and the bees and all that stuff. I had to learn all that stuff on my own. Mm -hmm. And I figured it all out. In fact, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I was able to, to just figure everything out on my own. I figured it out myself. And I, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. a, a stupid child anyway. I wasn't a, a silly child. But all of us, mm -hmm. not everybody's not like me. You know, a lot of us, a lot of people are, unfortunately, they, they need somebody to, to guide them and lead them. And they don't have common sense at all. They just, they, they make, 
they make poor decisions one after the other. Like, God damn, you don't don't have no brains at all. Don't have no brains at all. So I can't compare myself. I can't compare myself to others. But I do know that the Mississippi campaign is the is the best option that we have, most realistic option that we have. If you can't do that, you, you were done. Because we're already behind the eight ball. It just gets worse. We need something that can give us some push us up in line quick. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing mm -hmm. that. Because we're too far behind. If we wasn't so far behind, these things that people are doing, that's fine. But we're too far behind. We need something that can, you know, give us that push, that energy, that boost. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it big, you might as well not do it at all. These little tiny projects right. that we do or whatever, it might make you feel good and, and whatever, but the reality is it, it, it might do something for your own personal family pockets, but us as a people, it do mm -hmm. nothing for us as a as a class of people. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this uh, uh Chu, could you explain um the term soul power, like uh what that is, where it comes from, and how that's a better how that's a better name or label as opposed to black American, African American, or any other foreign identity, or whatever. I choose soul power because at, at one time it was used by us. Probably from the late nineteen mm fifties, -hmm. probably from the nineteen late nineteen fifties to the nineteen until it came to an end somewhere in the nineteen nineties. Mm -hmm. Soul power and black power used to go side by side. I know I lived it. And we used to call ourselves mm -hmm. soul brothers and sisters. And to my knowledge, I don't know what the origins is, but soul brothers and sisters, that came from us. African American is not us. It came from Jesse Jackson in the 1980s, and he's misinformed because he's he said African American based upon the fact that we're supposed to be African in living in America, which is false. Because mm -hmm. this is 2023, we ain't nobody, we ain't never lived in no Africa. And like I explained earlier, Africa is a relative term. We can't be the whole of Africa. Who are you talking about? Are we Ghanaian? Are we Somalian? Congolese? Rhodesian? Or whatever? I mean, what? Uh, Liberia? Actually, Liberia, if you want to claim Africa, why don't they claim Liberia? Because really, Liberia, a lot of our Liberia is us. It was slaves that they took that went to Africa and became part of Liberia. But you notice they never talk about Liberia. They always talk about some other parts of, of Africa. If you want to talk about Africa, talk about Liberia. And actually, before I start talking about the Mississippi campaign, I was talking about let's help Liberia because that's, that's really us. Everything about Liberia is, is America. That's us. But they never talk about Liberia. Oh, that's the white man did that. The white man took control of all of Africa. So what? <laughs> where you gonna go in Africa where the white man ain't been? They said the Europeans took, took, took over all of Africa except Ethiopia. And even though they didn't mm -hmm. conquer, even though they didn't conquer Ethiopia, it's still influenced by Europeans. Mm -hmm. So you can't you can't dodge that bullet. Mm -hmm. But Negro came from, of course, the slave master. Even black came from the slave master. Because black, Negro, color, even African, all those are European classifications. If you go look up, do Africans except black as a classification, Google will tell you most Africans view black as an insult to them. They don't, they don't get with black. They're not black. They mm -hmm. are, they are their nation or their tribe. They don't, they don't mm -hmm. deal with that 
racial classification stuff. They don't do. Mm -hmm. Racial classification came from Europeans in the late 1700s. So black, African, all that stuff came from your oppressor. Now you take the label and you try to make it positive for yourself, but it didn't come from you. That's why you can't explain it. Ask them, uh, what is black? Well, uh, they can't really explain it. They can't explain it because it didn't come from you to begin with. It came from your oppressor. That's why you can't explain it. What is African? You really can't explain what African is because those people don't use the term. Mm -hmm. So, I could have sat around and researched and came up with something different, but out of respect and honor of my ancestors, I said, what's wrong with soul, brothers and sisters? What's wrong with the people mm -hmm. of soul? Because what it does, it takes us out of that race garbage. Because a soul, brother, and sister, we under, I understand that it's a descendant of a slave born in America, but it has nothing to do with color. We can actually have honorary soul, brother, and sister, like Hall and Oates. Remember Hall and Oates back in the day? They used to call themselves the Blue Eyed Soul Brothers. That group called <laughs> that group called Hall. There was a time when people wanted to be a soul, brother, and sister. Even the white folks, they wanted to have soul. There was a time when the white folks wanted the big afros. They wanted to be like us and dress like us. All over the world. They didn't want to be Africans. They wanted to be the black American. Soul brother and sister. James Brown was the godfather of soul. Mm -hmm. Aretha Franklin was the queen of soul. Mm -hmm. These he had a song called Soul Power, didn't he? Huh? He had a, James Brown had a song called Soul Power. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he also had a song, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Mm -hmm. These ladies were the funky divas of soul. Mm. And that came from us. Soul train. Soul food. See, soul is more than the music. Soul is our culture. Soul is us. It's the natural. Soul is the natural behavior or the evolution of a Slave people coming into their own, com coming into your own who you are. Mm -hmm. Soul is like a subculture of American culture. That's what it basically it is. I have to say subculture because we, we are within American society. However, if we broke off into our own land somewhere, then it would become our culture. Right. And then the children, after we're gone, they can develop something more, probably more appropriate. But to start off with, to give my ancestors, our ancestors, their respect, I said, let's just be soul brothers and sisters. Because I know when I was growing up, and even right now, when I say, I say, hey, what's up, brother, soul brother, whatever. When I go on the street and I call a brother soul sister or soul brother, you know, a lot of them are familiar with that. They don't have no problem with it. But a lot of people do have, I ain't black. I ain't no Negro. I ain't no African. Right. They do right. that real quick. Right. But they don't really have, they don't really have a problem with soul brother and sister. I mean, all kinds of people will gravitate toward, you know, like soul train. Mm -hmm. And it didn't make no difference. You was a Muslim. Muslims watch Soul Train. Hebrew Israelites watch Soul Train. You know, it, 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 was, it was something common. And we know what, when we talk about Soul Train, that's our music. It used to be called Soul Music, not R&B. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that it's called R&B or whatever now because it, it's lost its soul. A lot of it is just some outright mm -hmm. filthy garbage. So I'm glad they don't call mm -hmm. it soul music because soul music comes straight from the heart, comes straight from your being. And this stuff, mm -hmm. this ragtag stuff that you be hearing, that's not, I'm glad they don't call that soul music. I'm glad they don't. Because mm -hmm. it don't, it's just, a lot of it's just filth, nasty mm -hmm. lyrics, garbage, and people acting filthy. Mm -hmm. You know, even though, I mean, we're not no holy and righteous people, but we wasn't all that filth, you know, that the, 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 the twerking and take your pants down and, 
and all that booty shaking. We didn't do all that kind of stuff. And right. during the time of soul music, everybody was classy. The Temptations, classy. The stylistic, classy. The OJ's, classy. Right. The Supremes, classy. Sister Sledge, classy. Invo, classy. We done lost all that. Because we sold our soul. So, my self-appointed mission is to bring the life back and bring the soul back to us. That's my, not no God, my self-appointed mission is to bring back soul or bring back the life to these who have died for a second time. Because we already was dead under the slave master and we died again under black power, black conscience because we didn't know that black conscience and black power was nothing but white supremacy again. It's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's nothing but white racism and sheep's clothing. Because if you take the black out of, of it and put white, you can't tell that from the Nazis or the KKK, anything stuff that they're talking about. You can't tell the difference because it's the same stuff. In fact, black conscience was created by white racism. It didn't exist until white racism. Nobody practiced. There was no Hebrew Israelites. There was no Moors like that. Not for us. That stuff did not exist until white supremacy. If you take white supremacy out the equation, those things did not exist. Mm -hmm. They didn't exist because that's what they are. That black conscience, comedic. Look at it. Look here, brother. I'm gonna say this. I don't know how much time you got, but look here. I mean, it's common sense. Our ancestors was on the slave plantation. They knew mm -hmm. nothing when they first began to learn. They learn from the white man. They didn't know nothing about no Kemet. Who taught them about Kemet? Mm -hmm. It came from the white people. They didn't even mm -hmm. know nothing about Africa. Well, they, they did. They heard about it, but they didn't really know. It came from the white man. Mm -hmm. All the knowledge that they had came from the white folks. Mm -hmm. And then some of us was able to go different places and get information from other whatever. But the foundation was white folks. That's the foundation of it all. Mm -hmm. They want to come to us like they discovered something. You ain't discovered nothing. The foundation of your teaching and your thinking, it came from white folks. You cannot, you cannot avoid that. It's from white folks. Mm -hmm. So, just the fact that you said it, talk all this black African stuff, that's them. Because melanated people did not go by race. They did not practice race. They did not identify themselves by race. That's white folks' stuff. They started that racial classification. Well, you see. Kemet mean land of the blacks. That's what I, they tell me. You don't know what Kemet really means. Mm -hmm. Who made up that definition? Because you can't, you can't read hard. That's, you know, whose interpretation is that? Right. right. And if they call it the land of the blacks, do that mean they meant, do that mean that they meant the black race? You don't know what they meant by the land of the blacks. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't, they did not use, they did not use or practice racial classification. Right. Ancient people didn't do that. Ancient people identified with their nation, their tribe, and family. They did mm -hmm. not identify with that's why the Moors, there were white people who were, there was Caucasian Europeans who were Moors. Mm -hmm. They did not, they wouldn't, they didn't use, they wouldn't, they didn't identify with racial classification. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to get up out of that. So soul takes us up out of that stuff. So I can talk the way they do, but you can't call me a racist because I will never say black. See, they can call them a racist because they are identified using these categories of race. But I don't. It's a soul, brothers and sisters. How am I a racist? I didn't say nothing about black. I didn't say nothing about white. Mm -hmm. But I can talk that way. But they can't accuse me of being a racist because I don't use those terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so what I, I guess if this will be the last question, then we'll you know, go ahead and uh, get ready to wrap it up. So. Uh, do you feel? Do you feel like uh, the community like will ever wake up, or do you think it's too late, or are we on our last life, last chance, or is it too late, or what do you what do you think? <laughs> There's a cartoon. I don't know if you're familiar with. I think, I think, I think it's Bill Cosby and the Cosby Kid. And uh, no, I don't think I've seen that. You never seen? Hey, hey, hey! It's Fat Albert. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was another cartoon that Bill Cosby did called The Green. What they call it? The, the Green. Green something. It ain't The Green Hornet. But anyway, it's a cartoon. Something like The Green Hornet, but he's black. Oh, The Brown Hornet. I think he was The Brown Hornet. Mm -hmm. And that kind of question... If it was raised to the Brown Hornet, the Brown Hornet would say, where there is hope, there is life. So, there's hope. That's the reason why we hang on to these religions and that's why we do, a lot of, of, of us do the things that we do because we are in a hopeless situation and we hang on to hope. And so, where there's hope, there's life. But at the same time, as a person who is a realist, I understand that all stories don't have a beautiful ending. Some stories end in tragedy. And I'm just and that's just how it is. You can't help everybody. Like David Ruffin, I've been on this thing about the temptations. I've been studying and watching the temptations and David Ruffin and Paul Williams and Otis and, and the temptations. Mm -hmm. David Ruffin was going to die the way he did. There's nothing that you could do to save him. There's nothing that you could do. But then there are people... If you help them, they will help themselves. You can't help nobody if they don't want to help themselves. David Ruffin didn't want no help. He was comfortable. He was happy doing what he was doing until they killed him. So, but there was people, but you can only help a person if they want to help themselves. And so there's only one consequence. There's only one result. When you look at us, I really don't know. But if we stay on the path that we're on, I know we're done. There are, because I'm pretty sure you heard of it, I think it's, it's Texas. It states already Wanting to write us out of their history books. Mm-hmm. Yep. They bringing in they bringing in a lot of immigrants to replace the yeah. black vote to where we we're not even gonna be remembered or even relevant anymore. Exactly. So the process is starting all, already. Something something called an African American won't exist after a while. It's not gonna not gonna exist. Mm -hmm. Because we don't really see no value in ourselves like that. We're not protecting ourselves like that. 
you know, I don't care who you marry, but I cannot, I cannot, and I do not feel as though you love your people, you don't love yourself. If you marry as a black man or as a soul brother, you marry a woman outside of yourself. I'd rather have nobody. And I'm not even talking about an African. I'm talking about I want a soul sister. That's what I want. Because she's me. An African woman is not me. She might look like me, but she's not me. She don't know my experience. These women, if I talk to them, they know my experience. They know exactly where I'm coming from. A Caucasian woman don't know my experience. Well, it's not your experience that I want. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care about your experience. <laughs> so we have to love ourselves. And if we don't begin to love ourselves, see, people think all this African black, that's not loving yourself. Loving yourself begins with loving just who we are. Mm -hmm. All that other stuff is nothing but adornment. That's all it is. You don't really love yourself. You don't, you don't, you don't love your ancestors that you know about. Some of them you may be related to in this country. You want to tell me about some foreigners in Egypt or in some foreign land somewhere. But you don't even know, you don't even know yourself here. I'm amazed all the time when I learn about all the incredible things our people have done, even, even during slavery, what they've done to accomplish in this country under oppression. I'm like, I didn't know that. But you're gonna tell me about ancient Kemet or whatever. If they were so great, where are they now? And I can guarantee you, if those people in Kemet was alive right now, they wouldn't claim you. Like a lot of Africans don't claim you right now. You live in La La Land. You live in fantasy and fiction. Yeah, anybody will take your money, smile and skin in your brain for your money. Go to Africa with no money in your pocket and see how you get treated. Yeah, they, they Africans. They only invite the African Americans over the ones that got money. Yeah, the only the ones that got the money. Ones who don't got nothing. They don't want them. Yeah, they, they don't. don't want, they don't want you like that. But look at here. Look at here. You have biological relatives that you know you related to. They won't let you in your in their house. You can go knock on that door. Hey, bro, I'm having problems. Can I? Can I lay down in your basement for... If you don't get out of my yard, Negro, we related. I'm your cousin. You can cousin yourself back to the bus stop, wherever the hell you came from. And these are the people you actually know and you related. So you don't tell me that you're going to get some kind of special treatment from some foreigners 9,000 miles away. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, a few. They might do a few of us that way. I mean, there are nice people in the world. But as a people, they don't care nothing about you like that. And you're going to take from, from them? You're going to take their resources? I saw a video where, where two, two sisters was killed because they, they bought some land. And these African people, you can't sell that land to them. They don't, they're not, they don't belong here. And they killed them black American women, soul sisters. They killed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I heard that one and a couple of other stories where some tried to move over there and they burned their house yeah. down and ran them out. Yeah. And stuff like that. So, you know, I, that's fantasy talk. Mm -hmm. And again, even if you did come from Africa or whatever, that's over with. Like I told you, my relatives do not care nothing about going to Mississippi. They're not interested. Mm -hmm. They're not interested. They don't care. So why do you think black Americans should care and we don't know nothing about no African nothing? Don't, they don't, we don't care. If they did, 
These videos should be getting millions and millions of views, which they don't. They don't get millions and millions of views. Because nobody, they're not interested in going to Africa like that. They're not interested. They're not interested in learning about that. They're interested in how I'm going to pay my bills. How I'm going to pay my taxes. Put gas in my car. How I'm going to live every day and what I know. That's what they're interested in. That's what they're interested in. All this other stuff is unrealistic. It's, it's fantasy. And people, a lot of people just don't want to hear that. They don't want, they don't want to, they cannot handle the reality of, of things. But that's not my fault. And what you don't understand is I come from the same place you came from. I was a, I was a Baptist. And then I was a Muslim. I also was black power. I was you. But the difference between me and you is. Through my years, I see this ain't going nowhere. And it's got to change. Mm -hmm. Who gonna drive a car and you can see that there's something in the road and you just keep going and run over it? Nobody in their right mind is gonna do that. If you're going down a road and you see something in the way, you're gonna either stop or you're gonna try to go around it. You're going to try to avoid it. you got to find a different way. You're going to have to find a different way of getting where you need to go. But you don't do that. You, you have tunnel vision and you're on the road. You see something in the road and you just want to keep going. I guess you figure if I run over it, I can still keep going. That's, that's disaster. That's a disaster waiting to happen. And that's what we're doing, dealing with right now. It's disastrous. And we challenge people to come to my channel and have these discussions. Most people won't come. They'll, they'll play on Facebook or something like that. They won't come here because if you come here, you're going to deal with the real questions. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the answers. I'm going to answer. I'm going to talk to you like you on trial, which really you are. Because I'm going to prove that you are a liar. I'm tired of Babysitting you in Cotland, folks. You telling a lie, I'm going to call you a liar. I'm going to put you on the stand. I'm going to prove that you are a liar. If you want to believe in a lie, that's your business. But you are a liar. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to do. Your lie, you can believe in anything that you want to. But when your belief is interfering with the progress of a people, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. When you let your belief interfere what's in the best interest of the whole. There's a problem. That's why we cannot advance. Mm -hmm. In order to advance, we have to learn how to compromise and work with each other. Even if you don't like, you don't have to like nobody. These folks always, th it's all about liking somebody. You don't have to like nobody. We go to work with folks every day we don't like. Oh man, I gotta work with Johnny today. God damn. You know, he's gonna be right next to me on the on the line. Damn. But but when it's all said and done, the cars keep coming off the assembly line. That's all that's required. Nobody have to like nobody. People didn't like Michael Jordan. You see the videos on YouTube, some of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These guys were talking. I don't like Michael Jordan, but he got me my ring. That, that's that's all you want. That's what it's all about. We don't have to like each other, but for the sake of your children and our future, our future, we have to come together and do this. That's good because it can work. And it's room for everybody. Find your place and let's go to work and get the job done. It ain't about, this is not no uh, popularity contest. Find your place, let's go to work and get this accomplished for 
what's in the best interest of our children. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Because the people that I talk to, they know deep down inside. And see, like I said, it's a place for everybody. Just find your spot and go to work. And see, as you do the work, and as you and as we become successful, and you can see the vision becoming real, all these hateful things, and I don't like Angel Snuff Nuff Seven, he said this, and all that start fading away because you you got all this real stuff that's tangible. Mm-hmm. So you don't have time to talk about, I don't like so-and-so. Man, we're building a nuclear plant. And that nuclear plant is bringing electricity to our houses. Like, God, we could have... Myth detected, we could have done this a long time ago, bro. Mm -hmm. Look at our highways. Our highways is the best highways in the country. They said, how are they doing that? You go to any of our neighborhoods. Look at the grass. Look at the streets. Look at our sidewalks. Look at our children act. We gonna, it's about creating a brand new people. But see, if you want to continue with this mindset, you don't deserve it. That's why you're not going to get it. When you come into the right mindset, all this heaven you're going to get. And even the scripture said, the kingdom of heaven is in you. It's in you. But you got to do because you have to become heavenly. But you're not heavenly. You're evilly. You don't have the right mindset. So you don't deserve heaven. You deserve exactly where you at. Get what you you getting exactly what you deserve. But when you come into your right state of mind, then you will get the heaven that you deserve. And stop being so damn selfish because a lot of things is just not meant for us. It's meant for our children. It's meant for the future. Mm -hmm. Everybody that died in the Revolutionary War, they didn't get to see America. Even George Washington didn't get to see America as strong and powerful as it is today. They didn't. They didn't. Sure. They couldn't even phantom America being like what it is right now. But they sacrificed and they died so America could be what it is today. And those people, mm -hmm. those people honor their forefathers. No matter how racist, no matter what they done done wrong, they stick with their forefathers and appreciate what their forefathers did for them. And your children when you do right by them, they gonna, they'll do right by us too. Because we'll be the greatest generation ever produced. we be the generation to stop this revolving door. And now we can go up. We can go forward. And they will give you the honor that these Caucasian people give the honor of their forefathers, their pioneers. You just don't know what you're missing. But you're just going to have to take the right action, the appropriate action. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is hope. There is hope. Okay. There, there's, there's hope, but again, realistically, continue this path, you're done. They already trying to write you out of history right now. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And let me say this, brother, before we get out of here. There's some kind of fallacy. If we get rid of the white people, things going to be better for us. Well, you know, get rid of the white man, uh, things going to get better. Well, this the, the, re, mm -hmm. re, the reality is, if, something's be, if something began to happen to the white folks, the next strongest people going to take control. And they could be worse than the white man. Mm -hmm. you, just because the white man move out the way, that don't mean now you take over. That's, that ain't how things work. The next strongest people, yeah. the next strongest people take control. 
Yeah. I, I tell a lot of people that, like, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of people don't want to be Christians and want to become Muslims. I say, well, okay, you take away your white slave masters where the Arab slave master was even worse than them. Sure was. And, uh, okay, uh, they got all the Hispanics immigrants here now. If you take away the white man, then the next most popular uh, populated group is the Hispanics, and they don't like black people either. Exactly. So, yeah, so if you take away the white man, that don't mean that everything going to be good for us. It gets exactly. worse, like you said. And going to Africa don't mean, mean things gonna get better either. Cause the hell, they over there killing each other and having wars over there right now. Right. I don't know. They have this fantasy world, you know. Go to Africa, everything gonna be a paradise. That ain't that's not realistic. Get rid of the white man. <laughs> during the summer, you know, we had that little that heat thing during the summer. It was hot, you know, uh, during the summer, yeah. and. And I, I saw a lot of these blackity black people talk about, oh, them white folks is burning up. <laughs> you know, kill they're gonna kill all the white people because they can't handle the sun, and you know, and kill all the white people, which is true. Uh, Caucasian people, lighter skinned people, are more prone to skin cancer and all like that because of the sun. Mm -hmm. But the sun will burn your happy ass up too. Let's let's mm -hmm. let's keep it real. And during the heat, during the during that heat, uh, that time of the heat, during the summer, this summer, I didn't see none of them pro-blacks talking about I'm in the sun getting my vitamin D. Your happy ass was in the house under central air. Why don't they stop that crap? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I used to think, I used to think that crazy shit too. You know, you know, sometimes <laughs> they say, oh, you know, sometimes they used to say like, oh, black people can't get sunburned. You know, I used to, I used to believe that. Yeah, right. And so I went out. The, I went out the country one time to went out the country to South America to a beach. Mm -hmm. and I got sunburned so damn bad. I said, I said, I said, y'all a damn lie for 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 saying that shit because I sure got sunburned. Yeah, there's no, there's no life on this planet that can handle direct sunlight except plants. You know, plants don't have a choice. They got, you know, they can't move. But most animals get the hell out of dodge. Because the sun would burn, I mean, cook you. They can't yeah, help. You, yeah, you see, you see even animals and dogs and stuff, they don't sit in the sun no. for shade. Yeah, they look for yeah, shade. They don't sit in the shade. They're not that dumb. They burn, they burn you up. Mm -hmm. And another thing. The white man can't handle the sun, but apparently he was able to handle the sun enough to go to Africa and kick you in your ass. <laughs> and took and took over the whole continent in the sun. Yeah. Explain yeah. that one. <laughs> and they still live and they still live out in the deserts. There's white people in America that, that built houses out there in the, in the desert, in the sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just talking crazy, just dumb stuff. I, I don't know. It's mm -hmm. not realistic. I'm like. Okay, if, if the if the sun if the sun bothered white folks that bad, how could they take over a whole continent in the sun, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the jungles, mm -hmm. and white folks still yeah, go and uh, yeah, white folks still yeah, go uh, go to places yeah. where uh where where a lot of black people won't, won't even go, especially when it's cold. Mm -hmm. Black folks don't be mm -hmm. messing around in the cold. Till I'm I'm going to Antarctica, mm -hmm. Negro. Black folks be like, I'll see you, I'll see you, see you later. They ain't going to Antarctica. Yeah. White folks yeah. ain't scared to go nowhere. Anywhere on this planet, they go. They go. They go into the ocean as deep as they can. They go in the air as far as they can. Negroes don't be thinking about no stuff like they talk about. Man, where can I go get me a blunt? <laughs> and all that. <laughs> so, you know, but th yeah. this 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 uh, conversation could go on and on and on, which is tacky and it's pathetic. Mm -hmm. Because we should be wanting to end this cycle once and for all. And that's what I'm about. How to end it. You know, these people are offering these beliefs and these strategies that keep you going around in this circle forever. Like, when is it going to come to an end? It's got to come mm -hmm. to an end. I'm sick of it. On this merry-go-round. It's going on and never stops. Where it stops, nobody knows. What? <laughs> Where it stops, right. nobody knows. <laughs> right. I can't I can't do that. But I want to say to you, brother, I thank you so much 
for inviting oh, yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. you. I, I thank you so much for inviting us here. And um, really, you one of the best, best platforms and interviews that I've had in a long time. A lot of people invite me uh, really just to speak about uh, what they think might be negative about Minister Farrakhan or blackity black folks or whatever. They don't want to really hear mm -hmm. about like the Mississippi campaign and concentrate mm -hmm. on what we need to do to stop this evolving door. We need to stop that. We need to bring right. this. We need to stop this and bring a solution once and for all. We need to stop this. This revolving door. Mm -hmm. It's got to come to an end. Mm -hmm. So I want to send a shout mm -hmm. out to to uh, uh, those uh, in the chat room. Uh, we are simulcasting on my channel, uh, Angel Snub Nub Seven, mm -hmm. and uh, brother, put in your put put the link to your channel in in the chat room, so they can. Okay. Well, they they hear, but okay. you know, put it if you can put put the link in there. Uh, okay, and also I uh, I put um your uh, app in the description of the video, so okay people on my page if they see it, they'll know what to type in to uh, find your channel. Now hold on, now you got you got two channels, don't you? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, use see. I use Angel Snub Nub Seven. Yeah, that's the one I put. Yeah, and I also use Reality's Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. Okay. Right. You found me on Facebook though, didn't you? No, that oh, was you uh, on um YouTube, but then I just after watching YouTube, I typed in your name on Facebook to see if you if you had a Facebook. Oh, to see okay. If you had a Facebook page, but I know I originally found you on YouTube. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, but yeah, so I I put Angel Snub No. So if they type in Angel Snub No Seven, they can they can find both your YouTube pages, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I got that in the description of the video for anybody that. Uh, more interested in you. Uh, so what? What was it? Type I mean, what was it about what I was talking about that made you want to reach out to us? Well, basically, I mean, you know, it ain't a whole lot of people that uh that think like me. You know, a lot yeah. of people are sheep. They into <laughs> some type of uh, they into some type of pro-black ideology like pan-Africanism or mm -hmm. Hebrew Israelite or whole tent or I'm African or Native American Indians, I don't believe in none of that. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I don't believe in none of that. I, I used, it was a time when I used to, but I came out of that, like, childlike, mm -hmm. childlike mindset. And I, and I know you talk about that, too, because yeah. you have been a nation of Islam. You know how it's like, it's like a child mind like state that you have to advance from. Once you mature, you get older, you realize that, you know, that stuff is, it's a childlike ideology. Mm -hmm. So I heard you, uh, you know, talking about those things and basically just everything we talked about, yes. which is basically the same, same things I talk about. So, yes. you know, if I find an, if I find another person who, you know, um, I feel like, uh, you know, agree with the same points, yeah, I'll reach out. I don't have no problem with you at all. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. You know, uh, you know, you're always welcome to come and kick it up with us on our channel, too. Angel Snub Nub Seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got my email or whatever. I can send you when we get ready to go live or whatever. You know, I can send you the, mm -hmm. the stream your link and you know you can join the conversation. Yeah, I, I'll just let you know. Now, usually when I be listening to you, uh, listening uh -huh. to your videos, I'll be at work because I'm okay. only really off on weekends. Okay. But yeah, you can yeah, you can do that. All right. Yes, sir. No, I st I'll definitely stay in touch with you. Um, oh, before we get out of here too, I also want to invite everybody to our main lecture of the year, the uh, our equivalent to, to Savior's Day. <laughs> Nation Islam has Savior's Day. We have Soul Liberation Day. And Soul Liberation Day is simply a day that we dedicate to us, you as the individual, and how we overcome obstacles in our life. That's what that day is for. To celebrate you. It's not to celebrate some divine person, some special person, some famous person. No, it's to celebrate you and your struggle and how you overcome things in your life. And Soul Liberation Day is also the time where we hope a future celebration 
that we as a people one day we can get what we deserve after catching hell in this nation for over 400 years. Maybe that might happen one day and that is something to, to celebrate. Being liberated from oppression once and for all. So that's what Soul Liberation Day. And our theme for Soul Liberation Day is free your mind and the rest will follow. Inspired by these ladies in Vogue. It would be December the 7th, 2023 at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And on Angel Snub Number 7 and Reality's Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. So I invite you and I hope that you will take some time to come and, and uh, check it out. Camaraderie. What's the word? How can I say it? Camaraderie <laughs> with us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, December the 7th, 2023 at 2.30 p.m. And you're snuffing up 7 channel or Reality's Temple on Earth Internet Ministry channel or Reality's Temple on Earth Internet Ministry Facebook page. I think I'll be summer casting on all those pages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I expect us to have a good time. You know, probably one of the best best uh, soul liberation days that we've had, you know, within the last few years. Again, I want to thank our brother, the Myth Detector, for uh, inviting us to his channel. I really enjoyed myself, and I enjoyed his company. And I thank you so much, uh, your audience, and those who uh, uh, support my platform. I thank you so much, too, that you would come out and... Uh, watch this video tonight. Thank you very much, brother. All right, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate everything, and uh, you know we'll stay in touch. We definitely have to do it again. Yes, sir. Sometime in the future. Yes, sir. All right, bro. All right, bro. You take care. You do the same. Peace. All right. All right. Peace.